This happened to me about a decade ago. I was visiting my cousin, Silas, in Weston, West Virginia. We were chatting over coffee on his front porch, surrounded by the still and silent Appalachian Mountains. Our conversation drifted with time, the soft murmur of our words mingling with birdsong. A local missing persons case caught our attention as Silas recounted a conversation he'd had at the grocery store earlier that day. A hiker named Branson had gone missing in the dense wilderness that stretched out before us. The search had grown increasingly morose with each passing day. The next day, curiosity peaked, we decided to take a hike in that same vicinity. Armed only with water bottles and a camera, we set off from the trailhead. For hours, we followed the gently twisting path up the mountainside. As we hiked, our conversation turned to local legends and rumors. Silas told me about a group of cannibalistic mountain men that were said to lurk in these woods, but I dismissed it as rural folklore meant to frighten children. We paused for lunch beside a babbling stream and noticed something unusual. Peculiar markings carved into tree trunks nearby. Suddenly, we heard a snap from behind us. As we both whipped around, I caught sight of a tall figure out of the corner of my eye, but the moment was fleeting. As fear gripped us in its icy claws and curiosity gave way to dread, Silas couldn't help but wonder if there was any truth to those legends after all. I never gave the stories much thought, he admitted, glancing around nervously. But seeing those carvings has my mind reeling. I nodded solemnly, though I still doubted whether there was any connection between old fables and this uneasy predicament. We chose not to call for help because self-service was non-existent here in the dense Appalachian wilderness, and we didn't want to risk drawing even more attention to ourselves. There was still a chance it could have been a simple coincidence just another hiker or hunter passing by. We pressed onward, keen to put distance between ourselves and that eerie experience. Yet something shifted in our surroundings. The air grew thick with tension, like unseen eyes watched our every move. Silas tried distracting us with a lame joke, but our laughter fell short, tinged with nervous energy so we continued in relative silence. Suddenly, Silas stopped dead in his tracks, whispering through clenched teeth. Look at that! A mutilated body lay ahead of us on the trail. It was Branson, his face distorted in a horrifying mask of pain and terror. Our shock gripped us tighter as initial panic threatened to take hold. How could this happen? We examined the body from a safe distance, and then decided we needed to report this grim discovery to the authorities so they would know the search was over, for all the wrong reasons. Silas lowered his voice. Do you think those mountain men are responsible for this? I'm not sure, I replied hesitantly. We hid behind some trees as we heard ominous footsteps approaching. Whoever it was moved clumsily through the bushes, branches snapping beneath their weight. As fear threatened to betray our hiding spot with increasingly labored breaths, we stole fleeting glances at whoever stalked so close by, a group of massive men bearing crudely constructed weapons like they had stepped straight out of a nightmare. Our hearts raced against time, as dread constricted our lungs like a vice. I whispered to Silas, Go back to town and report this now. I'll keep an eye on them and follow them if I can but stay undetected as much as possible. As Silas turned and slipped away down the mountain, I steeled my nerves and focused on tracking the cannibalistic mountain men. From behind some underbrush, I watched them descend on the fallen body of Branson with a preternatural hunger. I did as I had promised Silas, and followed the mountain men from a safe distance. Their ravenous feasting on poor Branson's remains was an image I would never be able to erase from my memory. They were large, brute-like creatures, covered in filth and grime from their apparent life in these harsh mountains. 
Their faces were unkempt, with wild beards that hid their twisted expressions. Their eyes seemed devoid of any compassion or humanity. Despite my overwhelming fear, I found myself determined to prevent these monsters from causing further harm. Stealthily tracking the mountain men, I traced their steps back to their rudimentary encampment hidden deep within the dense forests of the mountains. Through sheer force of will, I made the decision not to call for help immediately, opting instead to remain hidden in the trees and observe the group's erratic movements. I rationalized that alerting authorities prematurely could put innocent lives at risk if they walked straight into this den of savagery. The campsite resembled a crude butchery, save for any sanitary standards that one would expect in such an establishment. At first, it was difficult to discern what exactly was being butchered amongst the chaos, until the group dragged in yet another lifeless body. A whimper caught in my throat as I recognized it as another missing hiker. The sun had already begun to dip below the horizon when Silas returned with several armed park rangers. As quietly as possible, we updated them on what we had witnessed so far. They listened intently and formulated a plan. Under cover of darkness and guided by my earlier reconnaissance, our small party approached the cannibalistic mountain men's campsite once again. As we neared, my heart pounded wildly against my ribcage, unsure whether our plan would work. As we watched from our hiding places amongst the trees, one of the rangers triggered a flare gun, which exploded in a brilliant flash of light over the campsite. The sudden illumination caused the mountain men to shriek and howl as they attempted to shield their eyes from the blinding starburst. Seizing the opportunity, the rangers charged forward with their rifles ready. The rapid, well-aimed assault caught the mountain men completely off balance and terrified, leaving them no choice but to surrender. My breath finally steadied once I saw the macabre troop taken into custody. In a flash, it was all over. The months-long nightmare we had endured had come to an abrupt end. As we started to recover from the ordeal, we took a moment to remember those who had not survived Branson, fellow hiker and friend. The story of our harrowing encounter with these monsters would go on to shock casual observers and seasoned investigators alike. Many found it hard to comprehend that human beings could be capable of such acts of barbarity. In the weeks that followed, there were countless autopsies conducted on those who had perished in those mountains painting an unthinkably gruesome picture about the mountain men's savage rituals. Families grieved for their loved ones, yet there was also a newfound sense of relief within our once quiet town, knowing that these murderous cannibals would now face justice for their abhorrent deeds. Despite our shared trauma and heavy hearts, Silas and I knew we had done what was necessary to bring closure to our tortured community. This terrible chapter of our lives was finally over, but it was a burden that we would bear for as long as we lived. As I later reflected on my near brush with death, I couldn't shake one chilling thought. If their bloodlust hadn't spared me that day by some twist of fate I too could have fallen prey to the cannibalistic mountain men's grisly banquet. But now, with them no longer roaming freely in the mountains— their murderous reign had come to a definitive close. Our community would grieve, heal, and eventually move forward, but we would never forget those we lost in the process. This happened to me a few summers ago. I was traveling with my friends, Neil and Tom, making our way across the USA. We stopped at a small town in West Virginia, close to the Appalachian Mountains. The first day, we decided to hike up nearby trails laughing and joking as we started. We admired the beautiful terrain around us. Hey John, Neil called out. If the accountant thing doesn't work out, 
You can guide city folks through this wilderness. We all chuckled and continued deeper into the woods. We noticed the pattern of footprints in the mud, an abrupt change from hikers to something unfamiliar. Night was fast approaching, and we dared each other to explore an abandoned cabin we stumbled upon. Cautiously entering the cabin, breathing in musty air thick with decay, Tom whispered nervously, I've heard stories about cannibals lurking in these mountains. Neil scoffed. That's just urban legend stuff. We searched the cabin for clues and found a pile of bones beneath a worn-out rug. A chill ran down my spine as we realized they were human remains. Panicked and speechless, none of us thought about calling for help due to our shock and disbelief. We need to get out of here, I urged my friends. As we dashed from the cabin towards where we believed our car was parked, terror flooded our minds. Through heavy breaths, Tom muttered that he had left his compass back on the table inside the cabin. Noticing our surroundings had changed drastically from before, I knew we were lost. It was too dark to risk climbing back up so we huddled together for what felt like an eternity. A few hours later, eerie noises echoed through what seemed like very close quarters gut-wrenching screams laced with terror causing chilled sweat down our backs. We dismissed them as Sarah's next discovery being stuck to a tree. As we rushed towards the scream's origin, hidden traps, ambushes and ample gunfire broke out. Our screams were drowned out by the echo of cold steel ripping through flesh and bone. Barely dodging the subsequent danger, Tom wasn't as fortunate. We found Tom with his stomach torn open, letting loose his entrails. Neil frantically tried to call 911, but there was no signal. We grieved helplessly, trapped by darkness and terror. We couldn't just leave Tom there, but we had to find a way out of this nightmarish situation. Sarah, Neil, and I grabbed whatever makeshift weapons we could find, branches, rocks, anything that might provide some protection. We continued moving cautiously through the dense forest, aware that the mountain men were still close by. With each step, the tension increased as we strained to hear any sound that could reveal their presence. At one point, Neil spotted something sticking out from behind a tree. Upon closer examination, it was a piece of torn fabric, similar to the clothes worn by the mountain men we saw earlier. This was solid proof that we were still in their territory. Our hearts raced as we stumbled upon more gruesome signs of their presence. Blood-soaked leaves and a discarded boot with a severed foot still inside. It became evident that we weren't the first victims who wandered into their hunting grounds. Sarah seemed to be on the verge of breaking down when she tripped over something on the ground. To our horror, it was another pile of human remains, skulls and bones scattered all around. We realized that these cannibalistic mountain men had been feasting on whoever they managed to capture or kill in this area for quite some time. Bracing ourselves for an attack, Neil whispered his plan for us to split up and try to confuse our pursuers while searching for any semblance of a path leading out of this hellish place. Unfortunately, as we separated and tried to make our way through the forest, our worst fear came true the mountain men attacked again. I heard Sarah let out a blood-curdling scream before being silenced abruptly. My heart sank, but I knew I couldn't afford to stop. Neil and I managed to find each other again after sprinting frantically through the underbrush. He could see Sarah's horrific demise reflecting back in my eyes. We desperately tried to call for help on our phones, but with no signal, it seemed all was lost. As we continued to trudge forward, weighed down by our desolate situation, we stumbled upon something truly unexpected, a narrow dirt road. At that moment, all reason vanished as we bolted towards the road, praying that the path would lead us back to civilization. 
The sun began to rise when we noticed a pickup truck approaching. Flagging it down for help, we breathlessly recounted our harrowing ordeal to the driver who offered his assistance. The driver was a local hunter who knew the area well. He confirmed that there had been rumors of a cannibalistic group living deep within these woods for generations. The hunter had never encountered them personally but knew how dangerous they were from those who had barely escaped. He notified the local authorities and escorted us to safety. Neil and I were beyond grateful for his intervention and promptly sought medical assistance once back in town. Our bodies were bruised and scratched from our ordeal, but it was nothing compared to the pain of losing Tom and Sarah. Local search teams returned to the wooded area in hopes of recovering their bodies and capturing their killers, those cannibalistic mountain men who roamed the wild seeking human prey. However, days turned into weeks, and no conclusive findings were made. The mountain men seemed to have disappeared like ghosts in the wind. Still traumatized by the events that transpired during that harrowing experience, Neil and I attended Tom and Sarah's funerals with dozens of unanswered questions filling our minds. We grieved together while silently vowing never to forget our friends who so brutally met their end in those perilous woods. Though time has passed since then, the once closed bond between Neil and me has gradually eroded away with each attempt to suppress those haunting memories we shared. Both of us have also relocated far from those perilous woods where our lives changed forever. But one thing remains constant, the brutal deaths of Tom and Sarah, forever etched in our memory, ensuring that we will never forget their tragic end at the hands of those ruthless mountain men who hunted them down like prey. This happened to me a decade ago when I was invited by my friend, Frederick Hackman, to enjoy a weekend getaway at his family's cabin. We were accompanied by a few more friends, Alice Hartfield, Ray Valento, and Lottie Tripper. We had been planning the trip for some time, so naturally we were excited. Our destination was a small cabin Frederick's family owned deep within the dense Appalachian Mountains. The environment was serene, with lush greenery surrounding us. Little did we know that this would take a terrifying turn. When we arrived at the cabin, it seemed like the epitome of peace and tranquility. We unpacked our belongings and settled in quickly. As evening approached, Frederick shared an interesting tidbit about his family's adventures here when they were younger. We laughed and shared some stories of our own. Feeling refreshed, we went for a hike the following morning, tracing our steps carefully. During our venture, Lottie discovered a peculiar tree with deep gashes on its trunk. It looked as if something sharp had repeatedly slashed the bark. Shrugging it off as the work of hunters or animals scratching their backs, we continued onward without further investigation. As we trekked deeper into the woods, Ray felt an uneasy sensation creeping upon him. He hesitated for a moment before mustering the courage to share his discomfort with us perhaps we were being watched by someone or something in the woods. Alice laughed it off dismissively and jokingly accused Ray of being afraid of his own shadow. Her words momentarily lifted everyone's spirits and quelled Ray's concerns. However, on our return to the cabin that evening, something far more shocking awaited us. The front door was wide open. It seemed forced ajar with great strength. Our belongings were scattered carelessly around the floor while odd markings tarnished the walls. Panic swept over us and nobody could fathom a logical explanation. Given how isolated we were, there was no means to call for help. The nearest ranger station was hours away, so we decided to arm ourselves and wait till morning. That night, unable to sleep, I kept watch over everyone from my window. 
An uneasy drizzle began to fall when I noticed a silhouette lurking in the darkness. It appeared to be a large man carrying an axe. But not just any ordinary axe. It had a nasty, serrated edge that screamed malevolence. Afraid of causing further panic, I made a deliberate decision not to inform my friends about this ominous figure. I felt helpless as I gazed upon this harrowing sight, wondering what he or they wanted with us. As dawn approached, the tall figure retreated into the dense forest. With little time left before sunrise and our friends still asleep, I convinced Ray initially to accompany me while investigating the area outside where the menacing figure had previously stood. With Frederick's hunting rifle in my hands and Ray cautiously following with a baseball bat, we stepped cautiously onto the damp grounds. The earth seemed violated by fresh bootprints that led deeper into the forest where we dared not venture any further. We returned to the cabin, informing Frederick and Alice of our discoveries. However, Lottie had vanished without a trace during our absence. Distraught by her disappearance, and afraid that something terrible awaited us in those woods, we made haste and prepared to leave. With each passing minute, our anxiety mounted as we found ourselves lost deeper within the dense wilderness encompassing us. Desperately seeking an escape route while trying to remain vigilant of any potential danger lurking nearby. In the distance, I saw a glimmer of light and hoped it was our escape route. We stumbled upon an old, yet seemingly operational truck parked on a narrow path, hidden by overgrown branches. Frederick, being knowledgeable about vehicles, managed to hotwire it while the rest of us kept watch. Soon, the engine roared to life. With its headlights piercing through the darkness, we drove along the winding path without facing any obstacles. But just as we thought maybe fortune finally favored us, we were startled by the sudden appearance of these monstrous figures on the road. These men had grotesque features like those out of a horror movie, disfigured faces, twisted limbs, and yellowish teeth sharpened to a point. And with every step they took toward us, I could sense a repugnant odor that strengthened my resolve to not let them anywhere near us. Frederick floored the gas pedal as soon as he realized these cannibalistic mountain men were chasing us. They also seemed capable of unimaginable speeds as they managed to keep up with our vehicle. It became an adrenaline-filled race against time with our lives at stake. Panicking, Alice asked why we didn't call for help earlier. The truth was that due to our location deep within the forest— we lacked any form of communication, leaving us at the mercy of these cruel predators. While speeding through the rocky trails, Ray spotted an upcoming cliff and yelled for Frederick to hit the brakes right before we reached it. He did so in the nick of time as we skidded to a halt at the edge. Not expecting this sudden change in momentum, our monstrous pursuers advanced uncontrolled toward the cliff. Their momentum sent some charging over its edge and plummeting into the abyss below, buying us valuable time to act. Quickly forming a plan, Ray proposed attempting to climb down while securing ourselves with ropes found in the truck. We had no other choice. It was a gamble we needed to take. While Frederick and Alice kept watch for any remaining hunters, Ray and I carried out our plan. Descending the steep cliffside wasn't an easy task, but we managed to reach the bottom safely, knowing that our survival rested upon this success. We trekked on for what felt like hours through unfamiliar territory. As we stumbled out of the forest, fatigued yet grateful, we found a small village where we could seek help. The villagers listened to our story with shock and empathy while offering the comforts of food and shelter. It turned out that these cannibalistic mountain men had been terrorizing hikers and travelers passing through the area for years. The villagers advised us to depart once recovered and never return. In honor of Lottie, whose fate sadly remained uncertain, we vowed to share our encounter with others, 
urging them to avoid the area where malevolence thrived undisturbed. The event left us forever haunted by not only this grisly horror, but also the understanding that evil sometimes lurked beyond our wildest imagination. We silently hoped that no one else would have to face the same nightmare as we did in those wilderness depths. This happened to me about a decade ago when I decided to visit the quaint little town of Harmony Falls, located deep within the Appalachian Mountains. My name is Jasper Thompson, and at the time, I was seeking solace after a rough divorce. I craved tranquility and natural splendor. Upon arriving in Harmony Falls, I checked into a charming bed and breakfast. The locals were friendly always stopping to chat and share any interesting tidbits about their town. One morning at breakfast, I met an older couple named Virgil and Edna Quimby who spoke about their grandson who had gone missing in the surrounding mountains only two weeks prior. Concerned, I asked more about the circumstances and what search efforts had been made. They disclosed that several locals had also vanished without a trace in recent months authorities baffled as to the cause. A heavy cloud of sorrow hung over these once joyful people. My wanderlust peaked. I set out on a hike through the idyllic mountains surrounding the town with my trusty camera in hand. With each step further into the dense forest, a growing sense of unease began to envelop me, as if something other than birds were watching from above. A few miles into my hike, an overpowering stench invaded my nostrils. Following this putrid scent led me to a gruesome sight, an abandoned homestead littered with the unmistakable remnants of human bodies torn apart by some vicious force. Overwhelmed by nausea and terror, I choked back bile as my legs gave way beneath me. I scrambled back into town, praying that someone would be able to explain this horrifying discovery. The townsfolk stared blankly at my panicked recounting of events before revealing that they believed cannibalistic mountain men lurked within the regions beyond their homes, forgotten souls that hungered for human flesh. Gathering those willing to brave a search for our missing companions, we set out into the wilderness in pursuit of these malevolent adversaries. We were met with shocking aftermaths of their heinous crimes mass graves hidden away and ominous signs taunting our return to Harmony Falls. Our party pressed onward, determined to end this reign of terror once and for all. Yet, every unexpected rustling in the bushes hinted at the presence of these elusive sadistic fiends. The tension mounted as conversation swirled around how these men could have descended into such unspeakable depravities. Days turned into weeks with no sightings, causing morale to wither amongst us. During a cold night when hope seemed lost, a scream echoed through camp. Our eyes opened to a terrifying scene, one of our own being dragged away into the darkness by wiry figures clothed in tattered rags. We pursued immediately, adrenaline pumping through our veins like hot lava. The sound of our friend's cries pierced my soul as we stumbled through thickets and underbrush in desperate pursuit of his captors. Impeded by the difficult terrain, we struggled to keep up with these swift predators. Mere glimpses of their haggard faces fueled our fire to rescue our comrade before he met the same fate as those who had come before him. The horrifying realization that our friend had been taken by the cannibalistic mountain men only fueled our determination to find him and put an end to their reign of terror. We followed the sounds of his cries, our hearts pounding as we sprinted through the dense forest. We tried calling for help, shouting into our walkie-talkies, but there was no response. The static noise indicated that we were too far away from civilization and we knew that we were on our own. Finally, we stumbled upon a small clearing where we saw our friend bound and gagged, 
his captors standing around him with sinister grins plastered across their faces. The sight of the mountain men sent a shiver down my spine. They were covered in filth, their hair matted and unkempt. Their eyes were cold and dead as they stared at us with no fear, as if we were nothing but prey entering their territory. We've got you now, one of them sneered, brandishing a blood-stained knife. Intruders in our territory pay the price, another one growled, his voice low and guttural. Our group hesitated, unsure of what our next move should be. If we attack them head-on, we stood no chance against their numbers and brute strength. On the other hand, if we fled without attempting a rescue, our friend would surely become their next meal. We took a gamble. One of us managed to find a large rock by the side and threw it at one of the cannibals with full force. The rock struck him straight in the face, causing him to stagger backward in pain. Seeing an opening for escape, I whispered encouragingly to my team before charging towards them with all the courage I could muster. Our desperation drove us forward and gave us temporary strength against seemingly insurmountable odds. Together we fought and clawed at them while trying to create a path that leads to our captured friend. The sounds of the fight were overwhelming with grunts, shouts, and the crunch of bone meeting flesh. Despite our best efforts, we lost two of our team to the cannibal's swift and brutal attacks. We needed a new strategy and fast. We noticed an overhanging branch nearby with the potential to topple directly onto the mountain men. With wild abandon, we focused our attention on bringing it down to create a diversion long enough for us to free our friend. With a loud crash, the branch fell onto several of the cannibals, causing them to scream out in pain. In that moment of chaos, we made our move. We hurriedly untied our friend and helped him back onto his feet. Run! I shouted, and as a group, we turned and sprinted back into the dense forest with renewed hope. The remaining mountain men roared behind us in anger at losing their prey but did not give chase. It seemed they had decided that it was not worth pursuing us further into their territory, as they were no longer guaranteed an easy kill. Through sheer exhaustion, we managed to make it back to Harmony Falls, shaken by what had happened but grateful to be alive. The gruesome sight of the campsite still burned fresh in my mind as we reported all that had occurred over these past weeks to the authorities. Our lost team members will forever live in our memories, their courage and bravery inspiring us during some of our darkest moments. In the days that followed, a plan was set forth to deal with these deranged mountain men once and for all. We could not let them continue their reign of terror unchecked, not after witnessing firsthand the depravity they were capable of. Authorities went forth into the wilderness with an avalanche of resources to ensure no stone remained unturned in their pursuit for justice. The group was captured, brought to trial, and sentenced for their despicable actions. Despite the darkness we had all faced, the strength of coming together to put an end to their evil held a sense of bittersweet victory that would never be forgotten. This happened to me three years ago. I was driving through West Virginia with my friends, Faye Monroe and Arlo Delaney on our way to see a concert in Charleston. I'd always heard the countryside was beautiful, but its lush green hills were hiding something sinister. Just outside the petite town of Devil's Elbow, the car sputtered and died. We were in an isolated area with no cell signal, making a call for help impossible. Faye tried to diagnose the problem but couldn't find anything wrong. The three of us reluctantly decided to try our luck at finding help while Arlo recounted stories from his childhood growing up on a Minnesota farm. As we walked down the remote stretch of road, the sun began to set, casting eerie shadows. 
Arlo mentioned with a chuckle. You know, if this was a cliché horror movie, something absolutely horrifying would happen right about now. We trudged on until we found a dimly lit cabin surrounded by ominous woods. Erratic laughter echoed from within while what looked like abandoned cars were scattered throughout the area. Chills ran down my spine. They approached and knocked hesitantly on the grimy door and waited. A scraggly man covered in dirt answered and eyed us suspiciously before grunting that there was no mechanic nearby. We cursed our luck as we journeyed back toward our car, only to discover it missing. With no other choice, we returned to the cabin seeking help, dreading every step. A sound like snapping twigs came from behind us as we approached the cabin again, this time greeted by another man, burly, scarred, and armed, standing guard outside. Inside we found an unsettling scene. Locals gathered around a spit-roasting pig on an open fire. Their toothless grins exuded menace. Resisting all instincts to flee, we forced ourselves into conversation and explained our predicament. The group offered to help in exchange for a few days of work on their property, so we agreed, silently praying for a chance to escape. From that moment, the true horror began. These men had a terrible secret. They were cannibals with an insatiable appetite for human flesh. We stumbled upon mutilated bodies while performing our tasks and realized their twisted preference was not limited to strangers passing through. Even people from the town had disappeared. They mustn't have like these ones, Faye whispered, trembling as she pointed at a crudely carved scrap of cloth tied to a splintered bone. The torn shirt belonged to the man who first answered the door. Our hosts kept us under constant surveillance and took every opportunity to torment us. A hollow-cheeked man with red eyes stalked us silently through the woods, making it clear that there was no way out alive. On our third day as captives, we saw our chance. While performing chores away from the cabin, we spotted an old hunting rifle in an unlocked shed. The decision to fight rather than wait for our gruesome fate was easy. Arming ourselves and sharing tearful goodbyes in case things went awry, we hatched a plan. Arlo would create a distraction while Faye and I attacked from behind. As we prepared, we overheard hushed conversations about plans to move on after one final feast, our feast. The anticipation rose to a fever pitch and each small victory only fueled our determination. A chorus of gunfire echoed through the night air as we fought our brutal adversaries, kicking and clawing against overwhelming odds. Insanity met savagery amidst blood-splattered leaves and battered iron. We moved forward with our plan to escape this horrifying situation. I could see the tendons in Arlo's neck bulge as he strained to lift a heavy rock. He grunted softly as he hurled it at the cabin, shattering one of its windows. Within seconds, several mountain men darted from the cabin, their eyes wild and hungry for violence. With a signal from Arlo, Faye and I emerged from our hiding spot behind some bushes. We aimed and fired our rifles at the men who looked less than human due to their ragged clothing and unkempt hair covering gaunt faces. The first few fell instantly, but more were coming for us. Arlo joined us and we continued firing at the approaching enemies. With each shot fired, our hopes rose higher. The mountain men were relentless in their pursuit, and their sheer viciousness sent chills down our spines. We realized now was the time to retreat if we had any hopes of escaping this madness. As we ran through the woods, the eerie silence was suddenly broken by the sound of Faye screaming in pain. One of those vile men had caught up with her and sunk his teeth into her arm, attempting to rip flesh away as he did so. With fluid precision, Arlo took aim and delivered a fatal blow to Faye's attacker. 
Faye's eyes filled with tears, but she kept running alongside us as we pushed forward through an endless sea of trees and darkness. Even though we managed to put some distance between ourselves and that group of monsters, we knew better than to assume they'd give up hunting us so easily. Instead of calling for help through our phones, which would have been pointless as there was no signal deep in these woods, we relied on each other, a tight-knit trio bound by survival instinct and a deep sense of camaraderie forged in such horrendous circumstances. As the woods around us began to thin out, we picked up the pace until we could no longer hear their horrid howls behind us. Eventually, we reached a highway that felt like a lifeline, civilization within grasp once more. A police patrol car slowed down as they approached us. They must have noticed our ragged appearance and distress. We shared our story with the officers in the patrol car who helped us get home safely. Reporting our terrifying ordeal to the authorities was not an easy task, but we knew it would be necessary if any other poor souls were seeking a pathway through the mountains. In the following days, a thorough search of the area was conducted by both local and state law enforcement agencies. Some of the mountain men were found during that extensive search. After seeing their gruesome work firsthand, none doubted their willingness to do it again if given the chance. They were taken into custody and faced justice, each receiving lengthy prison sentences with no hope for parole. As for my companions and me, we were able to begin rebuilding our lives. It was far from an easy process, but the events we experienced together during those horrifying days forged strong bonds between us. Days turned into weeks and life began to return to some semblance of normalcy for Arlo, Faye, and me. Never have I been more grateful for life's simple pleasures or the company of friends in those months following our near-fatal experience. We'll never forget those lost souls whose grisly fates had been tied unwillingly to cannibalistic predators that roamed these cursed woods or what sheer determination and teamwork can achieve even when unspeakable odds mount against you. It's said that time heals all wounds. I'm not sure this entirely rings true. However, time does teach us how to live alongside pain or memories of terror without giving them power over our present lives and that in itself is a victory worth celebrating. This happened to me about a decade ago, when I took a road trip to Crater Lake, Oregon. I was traveling then with my college buddies Harris, Stellan, and Clementine. Being raised in Texas... It was the first time I traveled so far up north. Stopping at a gas station in Klamath County, we met Ezekiel, an elderly gentleman serving us gas. He mentioned a shortcut off the main road that could save us an hour but warned us some wild locals lived that way. We laughed it off. The less traveled path lured us too much. As we advanced down the dusty road, tall evergreens towered over our car casting shadows as twilight approached. We turned around a bend and suddenly stumbled upon a collection of derelict trailers arranged in haphazard formation. Stellan stopped the car instantly to inspect the vehicles before us. Hey guys, he called out. I think somebody needs help. Hearing moans from one of the trailers, all of us cautiously approached it. As we opened the door to the trailer... Something terribly wrong hit our senses. We saw blood-stained clothes and then an injured man on the floor begging for help. He screamed as he grabbed Clementine's hand. They're coming back. You must leave. The sound of a branch cracking echoed nearby. Someone was approaching. Terrified and confused, we were uncertain if we should return to our car or stay put. Stellan suggested hiding within nearby bushes and waiting until whoever was coming went away. We carried out his plan without hesitation. Hearing rapid footsteps getting closer, 
Harris peeked out before quickly signaling. Three men! Following them were gut-wrenching screams of agony. The men forcibly pulled someone behind them with ropes. It dawned on us that these atrocities were committed by other humans, mountain men who hunted down passers-by for their sickly carnivorous desires. All locals were victims of their cannibalistic behavior. We were trembling in fear, feeling stuck and unable to escape. Clementine suggested calling the police but had no signal, and Harris reasoned they'd be dead by the time help arrived. We decided to take matters into our hands to save the captives mentioned earlier before leaving the area. Stellan led us towards his backpack where he hid his father's old hunting rifle handed down in secret. The weapon gave us hope, and we started preparing ourselves for a confrontation with life-or-death stakes. Creeping silently through the woods surrounding their lair, we followed their tracks which led to what appeared to be their central camp, corpses hanging from tree branches, dismembered inhumanely with blood dripping down. While Stellan struggled to keep his composure, Harris spotted one of them gnawing at a severed arm, its bare bones white against bloodied flesh. The cannibal sported a beard matted with gore, an imposing figure in his scraggly attire. As their terrible feasting continued, Clementine made a plan to cut loose two people tied together against a tree before gesturing us to follow her lead. With Stellan covering us, we managed to make our way over. While untying them as fast as possible, Harris nervously muttered that they couldn't outrun these monstrous men if they realized we're escaping. That's when Clementine revealed her final plan. Once they cut loose, I'll create a distraction for everyone else. She insisted so vehemently that it was her choice alone, and we reluctantly agreed. Once the captives' bonds were severed, she shouted at them to run and get help while she tossed a flare into Cannibal's camp. Almost immediately after realizing the commotion, they lunged in our direction swinging axes with frenzy in their eyes for unwelcome visitors. We took off in heated pursuit, weaving in and out of trees as we fought for our lives. Our hearts pounded as we sprinted through the dense forest desperately trying to put distance between ourselves and the bloodthirsty cannibals chasing us. Harris whispered a prayer under his breath while Stellan continued to cover our retreat. I could hear the enraged mountain men howling our names, their voices echoing through the trees. My legs burned as we raced through the underbrush, branches cutting at our faces and hands. We needed a place to hide or a way to lose them in the seemingly endless maze of trees and foliage. Suddenly, the once-bound captives we released shouted for us to follow them. Trapping their breath, they relayed information about an abandoned cabin not too far from where we were. Their hope was that we'd be able to regroup there while forming a plan of escape from these vicious predators. With the howls growing louder and closer, we quickly agreed on this course of action. The once-captured pair led the way, navigating through the undergrowth with impressive speed and determination. Stellan's face grew grimmer by the second, muttering that he wished he had brought more ammunition for his gun. The cabin soon came into view, old and decrepit but still somehow standing strong in this unforgiving wilderness. We hastily entered it, barricading the door with whatever furniture was left inside before huddling together in one corner. Our rescuers introduced themselves as Laura and Ethan. They knew nothing about these man-eating mountain men except that they'd been ambushed while hiking nearby days earlier. They gratefully thanked Clementine for setting them free and ensuring their survival up until now. Outside, we could hear the snarls and growls of our pursuers getting closer still. We realized calling for help would be futile given how far we strayed from civilization, not to mention that using a phone might give away our hiding spot. We decided to wait in silence and hope that the cannibals would lose interest in tracking us. If luck was on our side, they'd eventually move on to search for easier prey. 
Time crawled by as we huddled in that ramshackle cabin. I could hear everyone's breaths, uneven in fear and exhaustion. We didn't dare move a muscle or even whisper lest our location be revealed. The agonizing hours felt like days, but the relentless bang of our enemies slowly faded further into the woods. Eventually, their presence was completely gone, leaving behind a deafening silence. After what felt like a lifetime, we cautiously emerged from our hiding spot. The cold air stung my lungs as we surveyed the desolate landscape surrounding the cabin. There was no sign of the cannibals, only quiet darkness as far as the eye could see. With trepidation, we began to make our way back towards civilization following Laura and Ethan's guidance. We trod lightly, eyes constantly scanning every shadow for any trace of danger that might reemerge. No one spoke. The horrors experienced in those woods weighed heavily on us all. Every step forward meant leaving behind another haunting memory. As we finally neared familiar terrain, Harris glanced over at Clementine with gratitude. She had saved our lives and given us a fighting chance against an unimaginable evil. The thought of her courageous actions would forever be etched in our minds. Arriving back in town, battered but alive, we found help and reported the atrocities we had witnessed. A search party was sent out to investigate, but there was never any sign of the cannibals or their gruesome lair it was as if they vanished into thin air. We may have escaped that chilling forest, but Laura and Ethan's harrowing ordeal couldn't be forgotten or erased from our memories, nor could the screams and howls of those monstrous predators who had hunted us so mercilessly. We survived by staying together, supporting each other during those darkest hours. But the question still lingered long after our ordeal. What happened to those monstrous mountain men? Our hope was that they would never return to prey on innocent souls again. But deep down, we knew that the seed of terror would remain in our hearts forever, hoping we'd never have to face them again. This happened to me a decade ago, working as a traveling salesman in a small town called Lothridge. I'm James Volenheim, a New Yorker by birth, but I found myself drawn to the open road, meeting new folks every few weeks. That's when everything changed. One day, I pulled into Lothridge's lone gas station, wondering why my GPS had led me here. The man behind the counter seemed skittish. People don't come through much, he explained hesitantly. I could tell there was more to it than that, but figured it best not to pry. I checked into a cheap motel before getting dinner at the only diner in town. Again, faces turned away when I entered, and the tense silence was punctuated by hushed murmurs. A man named Jeremy Blakewell decided to approach me. We made small talk until he fumbled nervously with his coffee cup and lowered his voice. I'm not supposed to say anything, but people have been missing around here lately. Jeremy whispered urgently. People had taken wrong turns close by, stammered Alfred Lydgate, another local who'd overheard Jeremy and had come to join our conversation. I was skeptical of their story but decided to check things out anyway. Curiosity had always been part of my charm or my downfall, depending on whom you asked. The next day, I left early, following the path where others had disappeared, at least according to Alfred and Jeremy. Gradually, the maintained road gave way to uneven dirt tracks suddenly. My car protested against the sudden incline of the mountainous terrain and ground to a halt. Cursing under my breath and regretting this decision already, I climbed out of the car. On foot now through dense woodland that obscured anything beyond twenty feet ahead or behind me as it was quickly swallowed by an eerie silence. My instincts screamed, turn back, but it was too late. Up ahead, 
I spotted fresh footprints in the dirt. Curiously enough, they were barefoot and marked with deep cuts. The realization made my heart pound like a war drum. Someone needed my help. I followed the prince deeper into a canyon, the silence broken by a faint cry for help echoing in the distance. I turned around, only to see a tall man with a wild beard approaching me, shaking his head briefly. You really shouldn't have come here, he said, nodding at someone out of sight. Before I knew it, another man, even larger than the first, appeared next to me. Why not? The question left my lips without thinking when I suddenly noticed something strange about these fellows, like they were predators sizing up their prey. Without another word, the mountain men lunged at me as I tried to run, yet tripped on a rock instead. They grabbed hold of me, their ragged nails tearing through clothes to pierce flesh. The taller one clamped down on my arm with a force that sent shivers down my spine as he locked eyes with mine, eyes filled with hunger. That eerie silence only broke when all at once the snarling began, low and menacing as if it were coming from deep within their chests. They dragged me back through the woods while skillfully silencing my cries for help with their twisted limbs. Desperation surged through me as thoughts of being someone's late supper plagued my mind. As if responding to my frenzied thoughts, one of them let out an unnerving cackle followed by, We won't eat you just yet. My body went limp with dread when it hit me. These cannibalistic mountain men hunted anyone who accidentally entered this seemingly abandoned town. But Loftridge's isolation would not guarantee them permanent freedom from discovery or capture any more now since their latest prey had a fighting spirit. Bloody, bruised yet seething with determination, this New Yorker would do everything possible to ensure he wouldn't become another face in the missing person reports. Determined to survive, I searched for a way to escape as they dragged me deeper into the woods. My thoughts raced, considering every possibility. They hadn't killed me yet, so there was still time. I became acutely aware of the surrounding sounds. A branch snapped in the distance and water flowed nearby. The water caught my attention. Thirsty? One of the mountain men sneered, noticing my focus on the sound. Here you go! He shoved me into a nearby creek submerging my face briefly before pulling me back up by my hair. Despair turned into an idea. If I could somehow maneuver my body to wrap around one of the men holding me, maybe I could force him into the water with me and flee while he struggled to get out or drown him in case he pursued me afterward. As I prepared to enact my plan, an unsuspecting figure appeared before us, a hiker. His eyes widened in horror at our grisly group. I tried to call for help, but there's no signal here. He desperately offered an explanation for his intrusion. The mountain men saw him as a threat and released me to lunge at him. Seizing this opportunity, I sprinted away, ignoring the agonizing pain that shot through my bruised body. Although it was tempting to look back and see if they were chasing me or focused on their new prey, I couldn't risk slowing down for even a second. After what felt like hours running through the thick forest, I stumbled upon Loftridge's outskirts. Exhausted and disoriented, relief washed over me as I finally reached some semblance of safety. Quickly finding a vehicle, likely an abandoned pickup truck left behind in haste, I scoured the interior for keys or any other potential defensive items but couldn't find any. Determined not to stand still out in the open and vulnerable any longer, I fashioned a rudimentary weapon using materials like rusty nails and shards of glass found in the truck bed. It wasn't much, but it would have to do until I could find help or at least a working phone to call for assistance. Finally locating the main road leading out of Loftridge, my makeshift weapon in hand, I began my careful journey back towards civilization. Every noise I heard, 
from rustling leaves to crunching stones underfoot, made me nervously glance over my shoulder, anticipating one of those cannibalistic mountain men emerging from the shadows to recapture me. Daylight waned as I trudged down the road, painstakingly slow due to my injuries and heightened paranoia. Suddenly, ahead just around a bend in the road lay a miraculous sight. The town's sheriff, whose patrol brought him to our nightmarish stomping grounds. Gasping for air between words, I recounted my ordeal and the fate of the unfortunate hiker who had crossed paths with us. My voice trembled with exhaustion and fear as I spoke. The sheriff listened intently as he eased me into his vehicle to check on my wounds. Once he confirmed they weren't life-threatening, we took off down the same road I'd been precariously limping along just moments earlier, bound for safety and medical treatment. While making our way back toward civilization, the sheriff updated me on the ongoing search for others who'd vanished around Loftridge in recent months. Unfortunately, it seemed suboptimal terrain and signal quality significantly hampered rescue efforts in these parts. As we drove further from Loftridge and its gruesome secrets, extreme relief washed over me, gratitude that I had survived despite insurmountable odds confronting those monstrous beings that preyed on unsuspecting passers-by amid that desolate place. Yet that relief felt tinged with sadness too. Thoughts lingered on those who'd crossed paths with the mountain men and been devoured, especially that poor hiker who'd merely been at the wrong place at the wrong time. Despite escaping, those blood-curdling memories and cries for help would haunt me forever. I vowed to fight alongside law enforcement against this lurking evil, even if it meant revisiting that cursed town and confronting the demons lurking deep within Loftridge. No one else should ever have to suffer the same fate. This happened to me a couple of years ago, right before I left my hometown of Elwood, Indiana. I was living alone in my uncle's old farmhouse after he passed away, fixing it up to prepare for sale. My name's Deacon Meadows, a former car salesman with a knack for telling relatable stories at social gatherings. One morning, while walking along the wooded edge of the property, I stumbled upon something strange and unsettling, a disturbed patch of soil with bits of torn clothing and what seemed like mangled human remains buried nearby. Filled with dread, I immediately phoned the police. Detective Langdon Jacobs arrived and started examining the scene. Can't say I've seen anything like this before, he muttered. Why wouldn't they just bury the entire body? I asked, my skepticism growing. Can't say for sure. We'll run tests and see what turns up, Detective Jacobs replied. As we waited for more backup and forensic experts to arrive, we began to notice an odd smell permeating through the trees. It carried with it a faint trace of rotting meat. I mentioned to Detective Jacobs that I'd heard rumors about a group of deranged mountain men in this area who were reputedly cannibalistic. He acknowledged having heard those rumors but claimed that they had never been substantiated by evidence. The detective theorized that maybe these mountain men were responsible for the gruesome scene before us. Over time, as we discussed our lives and background further, more officers and forensic investigators arrived. The site was soon abuzz with activity, each officer careful not to disrupt any evidence as they photographed and cataloged every detail. Weeks later, after following leads and conducting searches in conjunction with local law enforcement, a handful of grisly cases involving cannibalism emerged in the surrounding forests across Indiana state lines. Mountain men sightings grew increasingly frequent. A tall figure with long matted hair, skin like worn leather, impossible for anyone to forget. I was involved in the initial search party, 
accompanied by law enforcement officers and other civilians who volunteered their time. Together, we cautiously advanced into the dense foliage, anxious while surveying the terrain for any trace of the culprits or their victims. One of our dogs, a gruff German shepherd called Whiskey, suddenly bolted forward with a frenzy in his eyes, barking as he crossed a narrow creek. We followed him into an open clearing centered around a dilapidated shack made of logs and animal hides. The ground appeared stained dark brown, causing me to shudder at the implication. Whispers fluttered anxiously between volunteers as we covered our noses from the stench with bandanas. A growing sense of urgency pervaded the air as we speculated about what was inside. Lighting beside a doorframe revealed bloody handprints smeared across it. Fear and anger warred within me, and I could tell that others felt it too. Are we going to bust that door down or what? Someone asked gruffly. We shared a grim nod, steeling ourselves for any terror within. As we braced against one another, preparing to bring the door crashing down, one of my fellow volunteers made an offhand comment that would have been funny under different circumstances. Pour one out for our friend Whiskey. That heroic dog deserves a shot at least. Don't jinx it. I responded before taking a deep breath. With a surge in enormous force, we rammed the door open together, with guns drawn, to behold the gruesome tableau inside. The room was staged like some sickening ceremonial space, signs of violence and degradation everywhere. Cautiously, we stepped into the gruesome interior, careful not to disturb the remnants of whatever horrifying acts had taken place. The shack was dimly lit, casting eerie shadows over the carnage. Gore covered every surface and broken furniture lay scattered on the floor. My eyes scanned the room, searching for any remaining threats. The bloodied handprints seemed like a warning, urging us to leave while we could. But we couldn't back down now. There were too many lives at stake. I hoped for strength as I led my team into what was undeniably a terrifying situation. As we moved through the shack, it became abundantly clear that it had been inhabited by a group of cannibalistic mountain men who were hunting down and killing people who took a wrong turn into their territory. Their monstrous behavior was appalling. My team approached carefully, preparing for any sudden attacks. This would be no easy task. Why haven't we called for backup? One of my teammates asked nervously. Too late now, I replied curtly. They're close. We carried on with our hearts pounding and our weapons ready, knowing that these brutal killers could strike at any moment. Our continued silence only heightened the sense of doom pervading the air around us. As we pressed deeper into the shack, we glimpsed frightful details of what had befallen victims who'd ventured this way before us. Strewn limbs and gnawed bones filled corners and crevices. It was then that my heart broke for them and their families who would never know what exactly happened to them. Through our grim resolve, we eventually stumbled upon the quarters of these repulsive men, a filthy space with crude beds made from animal fur and rotting wooden platforms. We steeled ourselves against the cacophony of smells, human waste mixed with drying blood and putrid meat. And then it happened. Three burly men with matted beards and wild eyes abruptly lunged at us from the shadows. Their fierce expressions and monstrous demeanors sent waves of terror coursing through our veins. Reacting instinctively, we opened fire, our bullets sparing no time finding their unhinged targets. Yet they continued their frenzied charge valuing our demise over their own safety. It was clear these savage people were not accustomed to failure or mercy. With every step they got closer, inching nearer to satisfying their insatiable appetite for human flesh. With our backs against the wall, we fought for survival, utilizing every bit of strength we could muster. Then, as abruptly as it had started, 
it ended. The attackers lay motionless on the filthy floor, defeated by a combination of our determination and overwhelming numbers. The danger was finally over. However, the heart-wrenching image of their twisted faces would haunt us for years to come. In the immediate aftermath, we took a moment to regroup and check for injuries sustained during the ferocious attack. It was nothing short of a miracle that none of us had been badly hurt. We knew that we were extremely fortunate. We exited the shack with heavy hearts and trembling legs. Deciding that taking in the sight one more time would do little to help comprehend what we just faced, we retreated to more familiar territory. After sharing details of this blood-chilling experience with backup and calling in law enforcement to handle the situation further, we parted ways, each lost in our thoughts and forever changed by what had occurred. I often found myself reflecting on those dark events, struggling to come up with answers for why such horrors existed in this world. I couldn't make sense of it. There was simply no excuse or explanation for such appalling behavior. Over time, however, I came to deeply appreciate my fellow volunteers' bravery under such harrowing circumstances. Their actions saved countless lives, and our camaraderie was forged in the adversity we'd shared. Whiskey, our tenacious German shepherd, received commendations for leading us to the terror that mangled human souls so grotesquely. Though I could never forget the nightmare of that dilapidated shack and its gruesome inhabitants, I channeled my memories into fueling my resolve and continuing to serve my community and help those in need. And though the agonizing screams of their victims would forever echo in my mind, I knew that no one else would suffer at the hands of those brutal cannibals ever again. This happened to me a few winters ago near Clancy, Montana. I was out hiking, trying to clear my head after a rough breakup. My name's Jerome Fitzpatrick, and I work as an accountant at a local firm, not exactly exciting or adventurous. So, these weekend hikes were my escape from monotony. Little did I know that this particular hike would change my life forever. While reaching the trail's halfway point, I noticed something odd draped over a nearby branch. It looked like a blood-soaked piece of clothing, and a rotten smell filled the air. This should have been the first red flag, but I blamed it on some careless hunters and moved on. As I continued down the unfamiliar path, crisp leaves crunching beneath my boots, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin. Intrigued by this finding, I opened the creaky door and stepped in. The place looked like it hadn't been touched in years furniture covered in dust-filled sheets and old photographs scattered on the floor. That's when it hit me. Something was genuinely wrong. There were chilling signs of struggle across every surface, with rusty chains lying next to an overturned chair and disturbing graffiti painted on the moldy walls. The cabin felt icy cold and eerie, as if evil lingered just out of sight. My cell phone had no reception so calling for help wasn't an option making me feel vulnerable and scared for my life. While carefully studying the room, I noticed muddy footprints leading off into the foggy distance overlapping trails dotted with blood droplets mocking me as they disappeared into the misty woods. With dread creeping into every nerve of my trembling body, they beckoned me where no man ever dreams of going. But as fear knocked at my resolve, reminding myself that this was possibly a twisted prank or dealing with unfortunate squalor born from abject poverty life encountered in rural Montana at times gave me the last threads of courage left in my heart. I chose to seek professional help in town hoping their familiarity with the area could provide answers. As I hastily walked back to the cabin's entrance, a strange rustling behind me caught my attention. As if lurking just past the shadows was nature itself twisted into something perverse, 
ready to feast on my ignorance. It was then that I saw them a group of gaunt, deranged men emerging from the mist. Their faces still haunt me, hollow eyes with wild hair and cracked, bloodied lips revealing rotting teeth. These cannibalistic mountain men were grotesque manifestations of humanity's darkest instincts. I sprinted out of the cabin and back onto the trail, tripping over rocks and branches in my haste. Panicked gasps escaped me as I tried to shout for someone, anyone. But nobody had ever dared venture this far away from civilization. The mountain men let out guttural cries that pierced through the forest as they chased me down. It wasn't long before they were too close for comfort. Instead of running straight onto their territory, I decided to use the environment to my advantage. After seeing an old tree nearby with low branches, I scrambled up, hiding amidst its gnarled limbs. I could hear them all around me as they searched for their prey. Their guttural growls like some predatory creatures spread fear throughout my body like ice finally taking hold on a lake's surface after days of suspenseful cracking and spreading breaks under its collapsing surface. I breathed as quietly as possible, trying not to give away my position in the tree. The mountain men circled below, sniffing the air and grunting between themselves like a pack of rabid animals. If I could outlast them, I might stand a chance of surviving. As the minutes ticked by, their frustration seemed to grow. A few lashed out at each other with unsettling ferocity. They were capable of inflicting considerable harm not just on me, but their own kind too. After what felt like hours, they began to move away and finally disappeared from sight. I waited for a while longer before deciding it was safe to climb down from my hiding place. Once I reached the ground, I resisted the urge to run straight back toward civilization, as I didn't want to risk running into the mountain men again. Instead, I opted for a slow, cautious descent through the forest. My ankle throbbed in pain, and I recognized it was probably sprained from earlier during my frantic escape. Still, there was no time for self-pity. I had to keep moving if I wanted any chance of living through this ordeal. As the sun began to set, my dread intensified. Night provided perfect cover for those inhuman creatures. With every snap and rustle of a branch or leaves underfoot, panic threatened to overtake me. But I knew panicking would only hasten a gruesome end. My rumbling stomach reminded me that food would soon become a priority too. In an attempt to satiate it temporarily and secure some much-needed sustenance for the journey ahead, I picked wild berries along the way with cautious hands. Croaking noises echoed loudly as frogs made their presence known. However, I dismissed them quickly and focused on distance. Days passed, or was it longer? Time seemed hard to measure without access to daylight, and exhaustion started taking its toll on my body. Still not completely clear of the mountain men, I knew I couldn't risk stopping for more than a few moments to catch my breath. It was while I was resting against a tree that I heard the faint murmur of voices in the distance. Cautiously, I listened intently as the sound grew closer. Unlike before, these voices sounded like regular human beings instead of those cannibalistic killers. Was it possible? Could they be hikers or forest rangers who might help me? Remaining concealed behind trees and bushes, I slowly moved toward the group of people, hoping that they could be trusted. As they came into view, I saw that they were a small search party outfitted with gear and backpacks I was saved. Summoning every ounce of strength left in me, I stumbled out from my cover and called for their attention. Startled, the search party immediately came to my aid and helped me sit down. As their gear indicated, they were indeed forest rangers who had been looking for me after my mysterious disappearance during the hike. They tended to my wounds and offered food and water. 
Their kindness almost felt surreal after experiencing so much horror. While some stayed back to ensure my safety, others went ahead to notify authorities about my discovery. As we made our way back to the base of the mountain, an overwhelming sense of relief washed over me. It seemed like a nightmare finally coming to an end. The rangers led me through unmarked trails leading back to the safety of civilization and away from the horrifying grasp of those monstrous mountain men. As we left those treacherous woods behind, leaving everything that happened with them, I felt a deep appreciation for life's surge beneath my ribs, along with the fragile hope evoked by each carefully placed step forward toward a fresh start. That ordeal taught me a lot about human nature, how easy it is for darkness to consume us, and that the dwelling of evil is not limited to folklore or legends. As long as I live, I will never venture into the wilderness alone and will always respect nature's unknown depths. I will cherish the memory of my rescue, reminiscing about the heroes who saved and guided me back to safety nursing an infinite appreciation for them in my heart. As for those twisted mountain men, they will be relegated to the foul corners of my thoughts, a chilling reminder of what can fester in our world's hidden places. Perhaps some mysteries should remain forever unsolved lest we risk falling victim to them ourselves. This happened to me around two weeks ago. It all started as a rather banal conversation with my friend Basil Malone, during which the word adventure slipped out of his mouth. This ignited a fire inside me. I couldn't help but accept when he proposed a hiking trip to the Adirondacks in New York. We packed our bags, and off we went. However, we didn't know that this decision would move us down a dark path littered with horror, death, and pain. The breathtaking landscape captivated us, tall trees touching the sky, an orchestra of birds singing their hearts out and a canopy of green foliage offering the perfect escape from life's drag. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Harvey O'Connor. I make a living as an accountant and live in Albany with my lovely wife and two kids. Although nothing exciting happens in my daily life, I love spending time with my family and cracking corny dad jokes. Soon after our hike started, Basil and I became drenched in sweat which attracted swarms of tiny flies determined to feast on our salty skin. It was mildly annoying but not enough to ruin our adventure. The air grew chilly as evening descended upon us. To pass the time, we exchanged age-old stories before deciding to catch some sleep in our tent. The next day brought more hiking, more scenery, and one chilling discovery— an abandoned backpack peeked out from under a pile of leaves. Among its various possessions lay torn clothing stained with blood that had long turned brown. Everything inside screamed murder and roused fears deep within us. We urgently debated whether to push on or head back, ultimately deciding to hike further. In hindsight, what fools we were. Our journey continued until dusk when we set up camp again amidst the eerie silence broken only by the distant hooting of owls. I'd gotten up for what you might call nature's calling when something behind a tree caught my eye. It was a disfigured, horrendous face with bloodshot eyes and yellow rotting teeth. The air grew heavy with dread and sweat trickled on my forehead as I heard footsteps stealthily approaching our tent. I couldn't think clearly, but guilt swelled in my chest for choosing to carry on instead of turning back. As I listened to the horrifying crunch of leaves under someone's feet, I prayed for Basil and myself, wishing for some divine intervention. We had become trapped in a nightmare that devoured any illusion of sanity. How could we have known this picturesque landscape held such darkness? Why hadn't we asked anyone before coming out here? The secret remained hidden, 
whispers that talked about the unspeakable evil lurking in these mountains never reached our ears. Maybe those who knew couldn't bring themselves to face it or failed in their attempts to spread the word. I pondered reaching for my phone to call for help but feared being overheard by our sinister stalker. This agonizing situation worsened when Basil stirred in his sleep muttering words tangled with unease. My mind raced at breakneck speed. One tiny mistake could sentence us to certain death. As I weighed the risks of staying silent against revealing our location, that grotesque figure barged into my thoughts, hunger and inhumanity oozing out of its depraved eyes. Humans weren't supposed to look like that. Another reminder that we'd wandered into a territory where monsters reigned supreme. It became clear. We bumped into their hunting grounds, a gang of cannibalistic mountain men who delighted in causing pain and consuming their prey piece by bloody piece. We only knew one thing. They wanted us as their next meal. Movement near the edge of the woods caught my attention, and I knew our stalker had finally shown himself. A mountain man, disheveled and filthy, approached with a menacing gaze I couldn't help but lock onto. Clothes covered in stains hinted at his violent profession, while greasy hair and a mangled beard completed his grotesque appearance. Fear overcame all rational thought, compelling me to action. I shook Basil awake, urgently whispering in his ear that it was time to leave. He reacted instantaneously and sprang to his feet, throwing our belongings into the backpack as quickly as possible. Who are they? he asked nervously as we tried to move away from our campsite stealthily. Somehow they knew we were here. I don't know, I replied voice shaky. But we're not sticking around to find out. As we navigated the treacherous terrain on our way down the mountainside, panic fueled our pace. The moonlit path offered little comfort or clarity as we struggled against the rocks and brush beneath us. Help was our only hope, but who could we turn to? Neither of us had any reception on our phones. The isolation of these mountains simultaneously silenced their buzzing outside world and amplified our vulnerability. More footsteps behind us confirmed that we were far from alone now. Several more of these mountain men appeared along the trail at different intervals, stalking us like prey. Panic surged through my veins with each confirmation of their presence. Can you run? Basil asked between heavy breaths. I think so, I replied despite the growing fatigue besieging my muscles. Good. He paused for a moment before barking out loud. Now! We sprinted down the trail as fast as our legs would carry us, desperation and fear driving us onward through exhaustion's clutches. It felt like an eternity before we finally spotted a remote cabin nestled at the foot of the mountains, our only chance of survival. Without hesitation, we burst through the door and stumbled inside, reaching for whatever makeshift weapon we could find. In my hands, a rusty shovel transformed into an instrument of survival. A fleeting glance at Basil informed me he had chosen a similar fate with a cast-iron skillet. The stalkers were relentless. Their grotesque appearances became more evident as they neared. Faces stained with dried blood and malice mirrored their sadistic intentions, while gnarled hands hung heavy with well-aged brutality. They encircled us in suffocating tension, making their intent clear. They had us right where they wanted us. Our backs now firmly against the cabin's wall, Basil and I stared them down with steely determination. Knowing that neither of us could win in a fight against these monstrous adversaries, we gritted our teeth and resolved to make our last stand. Just as the first mountain man lunged forward with vicious hunger in his eyes, a sharp crack echoed through the night air. The tension momentarily faded into confusion as the attacker fell limp to the ground, a bullet hole left steaming between his eyes. One by one, 
More shots rang out, sending each vile attacker collapsing like discarded marionettes under the moon's unyielding gaze. Believing our end was imminent, we clung to each other for support rather than resistance as our aggressors fell. An unfamiliar voice called out from beyond the clearing. Hey! Are you two all right? From the darkness emerged our rescuer's silver star pinned on his chest and rifle still smoking in his grip. He had been conducting routine ranger patrols, responding to gunshots that earlier echoed throughout these treacherous mountains. Shaken but alive, both Basil and I looked at one another before embracing tightly, grateful to be safe after such an ordeal. As for our stalkers, Justice awaited those who survived, shackled in chains to be held accountable for their monstrous actions. In the end, our only intention had been to explore the beauty of these mountains. We had no idea that such evil lurked in their shadows, patiently waiting for its next victims. But despite the treacherous ordeal, we knew that we had each other and would overcome any obstacle together as long as as we lived. This happened to me around six years ago when I was hiking in the Appalachian Mountains. My name is Carlton Beckett, and I was a recently divorced father of two at the time, seeking solace in solitude and reconnecting with nature. The beauty of the lush green mountains felt like a reprieve from the stress of city life and my failed marriage. My trip took me to a secluded campsite where I met a diverse group of travelers. There was Maxwell Hartley, a 34-year-old history teacher, Evelyn Forsyth, 40 years old, an energetic woman with an intriguing accent, her sister Sabrina, quiet and brooding, and siblings Frederick and Jocelyn Howard. We laughed together around the bonfire that night, sharing stories and jokes. Early next morning, we came across something appalling. Blood-soaked patches of clothing were strewn near the campsite. Stomachs churned as we surveyed the eerie sight. We didn't know who it could have belonged to. Deciding to stick together for safety, our group proceeded towards a marked trail spin. Nearby, we saw an older man with snow-white beard named Hartford Thorne, who warned us against wandering past some abandoned cabins up on the ridge. Reassured but still unnerved by his advice, we forged ahead with caution. We noticed sounds in the distance, sticks snapping and subtle grunts that fueled our growing apprehension. After some debate about whether to seek help or continue onwards, we decided to push forward after realizing our phones had no signal. As evening approached, we discovered carcasses of small animals littering the trail rabbits and squirrels with neat holes pierced through their bodies. What could do this? Evelyn whispered nervously. Our hearts pounded as we reached the ridge and stumbled upon those very cabins Thorn warned us about. Despite all logic screaming to stay away, Curiosity drew us closer. Entering the first cabin, a chilling sight awaited us. Human bones scattered across the floor glistened under the moonlight, picked clean and cracked open. The reality of our situation struck with terrible force. We were being hunted. But by whom? Or what? An unearthly roar pierced the eerie silence as a monstrous figure emerged from the shadows. Standing over seven feet tall, with matted hair covering its sinewy body, it lunged at us with ferocious speed. Run! Run now! Maxwell shouted in terror, while I tried to process the grim scene unfurling before my eyes. Scattering in fear, we desperately tried to find an escape route as the creature tore through our ranks. Sabrina let out a blood-curdling scream succumbing before our helpless eyes. My heart raced and adrenaline surged as I sprinted into the woods, when suddenly I tripped over a gnarled tree root. 
Frederick offered his hand and helped me back to my feet before he was tackled violently mid-sentence. The creature mercilessly bit into his flesh. Carlton, help me! He cried out his final plea, but I couldn't bring myself to respond. Consumed by terror and guilt, I stumbled forward in raw survival mode. The realization that we were being hunted by these cannibalistic mountain men brought new urgency to my flight. I spotted Andrew, another member of our group, rushing toward a small cliff that seemed to offer a chance to escape the monster. Carlton, over here! he yelled, waving at me frantically. I didn't hesitate, sprinting in his direction with the creature's snarls echoing behind me. We climbed up the rocky incline and managed to find temporary safety. I can't believe this is happening, panted Andrew. Do you think the others are okay? I stared at him speechless and shrugged. We both knew that they might not be. Suddenly, an idea struck me, my cell phone. In all the chaos, I had forgotten about it. I fumbled through my pockets and found it intact. I'm going to call for help, I said, fingers shaking as I desperately tried to dial the emergency number. No signal. We were too deep in the woods. Defeated, we debated whether to turn back and search for survivors or keep moving forward until we found help or a signal. We knew splitting up could mean certain death, so we decided to stick together while climbing higher up on the cliffside, hoping for a phone signal. As we continued our ascent, more roars rumbled below us. The cannibalistic mountain men were getting closer. The gruesome sight of their ravaged faces sent shivers down my spine. Their bloodshot eyes remained fixated on us with an insatiable hunger driving them forward. Turning away from these human monsters, we understood that our only option was to jump into the river below if trapped by them on this ledge. The thought of being eaten alive was far worse than any injury we could sustain in a jump. Moments later, that decision hung before us. Two mountain men cornered us on the edge of the cliff. I desperately prayed to find a signal on my phone, but with no luck. Judging the distance to the river and gauging our chances, Andrew breathed heavily before yelling, On the count of three! Glancing back at the approaching cannibals, I nodded my agreement. One, two, three! We leaped into the air together, plunging into the water while involuntarily swallowing massive gulps amid shrieking screams. The cold shock forced the air from our lungs as we desperately swam to reach the surface. Breaking through to the surface and gasping for air, we glanced back at where we had jumped from. They were gone, for now. Barely evading death again, we swam downstream with renewed urgency until finding a small shore. We dragged ourselves onto solid ground, shivering and exhausted as relief washed over us. With trembling hands, I took out my phone once more. To our sheer joy and absolute disbelief, it finally displayed a signal bar. Praying that it would last long enough for help to arrive, I dialed emergency services. We told them our story and were told help was on its way as long as we stayed put. Relieved beyond words, Andrew and I huddled together for warmth as we awaited rescue. This nightmare was finally coming to an end. When help finally arrived, they guided us out of the woods and informed us about the rescue operations conducted in search of our friends. Sabrina and Frederick hadn't made it. They were found brutally mauled by these monstrous men, but Maxwell managed to survive by hiding away in one of their filthy lairs. Our shared trauma bound us together closely in those desperate moments. Escaping cannibalistic mountain men bent on capturing or killing us felt like a lifetime ago. Dusting off wounds as best as possible despite our haunting grief for Sabrina and Frederick brought some semblance of relief. As search and rescue teams hunted down those inhuman predators, we couldn't help knowing what fate could have befallen us had we not fought for our lives. 
The world gained some peace back as the cannibalistic mountain men were eventually apprehended. We knew, however, that the nightmare would haunt our memories forever, a chilling reminder of how close we came to a gruesome end in those dreadful woods. This happened to me a few winters ago. At that time, I lived in a small town near Bakersfield and worked at the local lumber yard. My name is Montro Cummings. Born and raised in the United States, I come from a long line of lumberjacks. I have always admired their strength and resilience. One evening, exhausted from work, I decided to take a shortcut home through the nearby woods. As I walked, I noticed something peculiar. There were strange markings on trees that seemed to double as a trail. Despite my skepticism, curiosity took over, and I followed these markings deep into the forest. The sun set rapidly, and darkness enveloped me. It was then that I stumbled upon an air of unsettling silence which amplified my heartbeat. During my walk, I heard what sounded like muffled screams in the distance. Concerned and uncertain what steps to take next, calling for help was futile as there was no cell reception in these remote woods. I nervously continued, eventually reaching a small clearing with one dim lantern hanging by a decrepit cabin. A tactile sense of fear washed over me like cold water when I noticed human remains scattered near the doorstep. Bloody bones gnawed on to their very core. Before time allowed my feet to escape, a group of harrowing figures emerged from the darkness, mountain men with filthy beards and wild unkempt hair. These monstrous beings oozed malice from every pore as they licked their knives hungrily. My mind raced as I struggled to comprehend that these men were cannibals those who hunted and feasted on unfortunate souls who ventured too far off the beaten path. The scent of blood hung pungently in the air as my adrenaline fueled my escape down an unforeseen path where agonizing screams echoed behind me. Suddenly, one man broke free from the group and chased me through the eerie woods. My heart threatened to tear through my chest as I darted, zigzagging in a desperate attempt to outsmart him. He failed to speak a single word as he pursued me with his eyes locked on me like a predator. Only his guttural breaths filled the cold air which I felt against my neck. Arms trembling at my sides, my grip on a nearby branch tightened, ready to defend myself if cornered. Momentarily losing sight of my pursuer, I managed to hide and catch my breath, the bitter taste of fear consuming me. Minutes turned into hours, and stillness engulfed the forest once again. My nerves became frayed and snapped upon hearing footsteps grow near. Fear overpowered me as the cannibal caught up with his quarry, me. The brutality I witnessed next was barbaric. As I tried to fight him off with my branch, he took delight in maiming me, severing one of my fingers with precise incision before moving on toward further mayhem. The cold bite from my lost digit mixed with warm blood as it streamed down my hand. As excruciating pain consumed me, another unwitting victim wandered into the cannibal's territory. In that horrifying instant, one of the mountain men attacked them. A gut-wrenching crunch of bone echoed through our makeshift battleground. Gunshots rang out in the air as more lumberjacks arrived but their involvement seemed only to worsen the situation by enraging our tormentors even more. The sound of the gunshots seemed to paralyze me for just a moment, but I knew that I had to find a way out of this mayhem. Another lumberjack, having witnessed the horror unfolding, screamed and began running blindly into the woods, leaving me with no other options. I took my chances and called out for help, hoping that someone, anyone, would hear my desperate cries and come to our aid. In the distance, I saw a figure coming closer. At first, I wasn't sure if it was friend or foe. 
Moving closer, I recognized the face of Jim, one of our fellow lumberjacks. He had a shotgun and wore a look of grim determination. I quickly filled Jim in on what had transpired as we moved deeper into the forest. We needed to find somewhere safe to regroup and call for help. Our movement was cautious yet swift as we desperately sought shelter from the danger following us. My hand shook while I gripped my branch tightly for support, my useless index finger now wrapped in thick fabric in an attempt to lessen its bleeding. As we continued searching for a place where we wouldn't be tracked by these murderous mountain men, we stumbled upon a collapsed cave entrance. The entrance was small but could accommodate our group with ease once cleared. It was worth trying to hide there as it provided natural cover from our pursuers. Together with Jim and anyone else who managed to find us during our frenzied retreat through the forest, a total of six courageous souls, we began moving massive boulders out of the way, revealing the cave's cramped interior. Once inside, Though we hoped it provided safety, fear clung on to each of us like a second shadow. Jim delegated responsibilities. Three people would guard our sanctuary while another two ventured outside to call for help on their walkie-talkies. The world shifted around us quickly and precariously. Things went from stable to volatile in mere minutes. As each minute trickling by felt like hours, the disturbance outside did not subside. We could still hear screams of torment and gunfire echoing around us. I held my breath as one of the mountain men loomed near the cave entrance, a twisted smirk visible on his filthy, bearded face. His massive hands gripped a blood-streaked axe as he sniffed the air, trying to pick up our scent. Thankfully, we'd hidden ourselves far enough in the darkness that he eventually lost interest and returned to his hunt. Feeling a sense of mounting horror, I realized these wretched creatures weren't merely comprised of mindless violence. They possessed a semblance of tactical prowess and knew how to strategize, laying trap after trap in their territories for unsuspecting travelers like us. After what felt like an eternity, we received word through the walkie-talkie that help was on its way. Police officers were storming the area from all directions, cornering the crazed cannibals one by one. Apprehending them didn't go smoothly, however. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, these deranged mountain men fought with chilling ferocity until the bitter end. It seemed as though they embraced inevitable death as readily as they tore it from their victims' grasps. As we emerged from the cave's protective womb into a danger-saturated world once more, I looked back at our five-day ordeal that claimed many lives. Jim had carried Susan through this terrifying horror with her life intact along with three other survivors, Mark, our camp cook, Shannon, one of our newer recruits, and Will, an engineer on our team. While we mourn our losses— including Peter and Duke who had been ripped away by those monstrous mountain men, we find solace in knowing that they met their demise when law enforcement finally caught up with them. Their macabre reign of terror would haunt no more innocent souls. Together, we limp cautiously to the authorities, gratefully acknowledging our survival, built on a foundation of teamwork, courage, and determination. The memory of that horrorcore experience remains etched into our beings forever. As we enter the vehicles that will transport us back to safety and civilization, I know we will carry those ghostly events with us for the rest of our lives, reminding us of the evil that resides in the shadows of this world. This happened to me a couple of weeks ago, while I was on a road trip in West Virginia. We were looking forward to spending some time hiking and exploring the beautiful Appalachian Mountains. My name's Archibald Kingsley and my two buddies Brooks Templeton and Clyde Hutchins were with me. 
We drove through winding roads surrounded by thick trees that seemed secretive, as if they held stories. As we searched for a campsite, our GPS led us down an abandoned dirt path in the dense woods. The radio crackled, with occasional bursts of static overpowering the music. I'm a city boy always enjoyed my comfy apartment with modern amenities. Never gave much thought to the wild or what could happen miles away from civilization. It was Brooks' idea, really, since he grew up in rural areas as the son of a farmer. Clyde was eager to crack jokes as we drove deeper into the forest something about creepy mountain men living off the grid hunting people. We laughed it off because of how ridiculous that would be. With dwindling daylight, we set up our camp thinking we'd continue our search for an established campsite tomorrow. A sense of isolation enveloped us as darkness fell. Cell reception had long vanished, but it wasn't of great concern. We were here for an adventure after all. As night approached, so did the chilling sounds that echoed through the trees— eerie howls and rustling branches above possibly just wine playing tricks on us. We sat around the fire talking about life and family. The first sign of trouble surfaced when Brooks excused himself to relieve his bladder further into the woods but didn't return after twenty minutes. Worried for our friend, Clyde and I grabbed flashlights to search for him. We yelled out his name, silence hung heavy around us apart from the sound of soft weeping near a rocky clearing. Our flashlights met Brooks, slumped on the ground his bruised body filled with terror and exhaustion. Between heavy, shallow breaths, he recounted a horrifying experience. An unknown man wielding a knife had caused a long gash across his arm while chasing him through the woods. As tension gripped us, we decided it was best to head back to the safety of our car immediately. While we trudged through the forest, frequent snapping branches indicated that we were not alone. Through the darkness, I caught sight of a figure standing between trees tall and muscular with wild hair and sharp features. Before my mind could process what I'd seen, an unnatural growl sent shivers down our spines. We couldn't call for help due to no cell reception, therefore instinct told us to run as fast as possible towards our car. Exhausted gasps and pounding footsteps blended with harrowing cries in pursuit from our unseen pursuer. As Clyde stumbled over a fallen log, another figure appeared from behind a tree equally menacing but holding a gun instead of a knife. These were clearly the cannibalistic mountain men Clyde joked about earlier, hunting us for sport. Out of sheer panic and desperation, we continued sprinting away from these psychopathic hunters without any way to contact help or report their existence to law enforcement. They broke into sinister laughter as they hunted us down in their territory. Brooks' condition worsened from the chase and gaping wound. He could barely keep up. At his pleading request, I left him behind to find some way to save all of us from this ghastly fate, taking his life in my hands along with my own absolute terror. The forest seemed endless, and every tree looked eerily similar, causing me to question my sense of direction. The only thing I had in mind was to reach our car before the mountain men caught up with us. The chase had drained all the energy from my body but I knew that stopping now meant certain death. In the distance, I heard the faint sound of a road. Adrenalized, I managed one last sprint towards the noise. This could be my last shred of hope. As I got closer, I saw our car parked not too far off into the blurry darkness. Realizing that leaving Brooks behind meant he would most likely die, I made a critical decision I started the car and drove towards the nearest town to find help. My heart pounded as guilt set in about my friend's predicament, but the thought of facing the cannibalistic mountain men alone was even more unnerving. Upon reaching the town, I frantically sought a payphone. Our cell phones were useless without cellular reception. 
Sensing that this was my best opportunity to secure help for Brooks, I dialed the emergency number. 911, what's your emergency? answered the operator. I barely managed to explain our situation coherently. Being hunted by cannibalistic mountain men, Brooks severely injured state in their territory, and my desperation to save him and get us out of this nightmare alive. Hang tight, said the operator. We'll have law enforcement there immediately. Trepidation coursed through me as I hung up knowing that time was not on Brooks' side. While waiting for help to arrive, numerous people from the town gathered around me, intrigued by my panicked demeanor and ghastly story. Among them was a man who introduced himself as Gary, an experienced hunter who navigated those mountains for decades. Gary took command of Brooks' rescue operation. He coordinated with law enforcement and gathered a group of local hunters to accompany them into the menacing forest to save my friend. The rescue mission felt like an eternity to me. The chilling realization that the mountain men were still out there hunting brooks carried unbearable weight. Finally, I saw headlights approaching from the darkness. The rescue team had returned. As the vehicles made their way closer, I braced myself for whatever outcome lay in store. To my relief, Brooks was in the back of one of the police vehicles, battered and injured but alive. The rescue team had found him just in time before his condition worsened. As they pulled him out and placed him onto an ambulance stretcher, I grasped his hand, knowing that we both narrowly escaped certain doom. However, what truly sent chills down my spine was seeing three of the mountain men in custody. Their appearances sent shivers throughout my entire body, unclothed, with protruding ribcages and sunken eyes that seemed void of any humanity. Gary later informed me that they discovered remains nearby during the search, victims of those twisted hunters. My heart ached for all those who weren't fortunate enough to escape these sadistic psychopaths. The town managed to put an end to the gruesome story these mountain men had been painting with innocent blood. All of us who were involved worked together to bring justice for their victims and prevent future disasters for innocent travelers. As Brooks recovered in a hospital bed beside me, we exchanged pain looks at what we'd been through yet grateful for each other's survival. A pact formed between us as we vowed never to speak of this harrowing experience again. Although I've left that dark chapter in my life behind, pieces of it haunt me in quiet moments when I'm alone with my thoughts. My greatest consolation is knowing that no one will ever have to suffer at the hands of those cannibalistic mountain men again. This happened to me a long time ago in Kenilworth, Utah. After a hectic day, I decided to take a shortcut through the mountains. My name's Samuel Forrester, and back then, I was working two jobs just to make ends meet. Midway, my car began to sputter and gave out. It was getting dark and I didn't have any cell reception, so I started walking. I kept thinking of my wife and three kids at home, praying for their safety. As I walked, I came across typical mountain scenery, trees, rocks, but something stuck out. It was a large bone, maybe human or animal. Puzzled but curious, I pocketed it as evidence. Hours later, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin. Curiosity got the better of me and I peeked in. The sight inside turned my stomach. Blood-stained walls and a makeshift table with rusty knives lay inside. Panic set in. However, remembering my family waiting for me at home gave me strength. I knew I had to find help or at least a place with cell signal. As night fell and temperatures dropped, my concern deepened. Walking by moonlight along the deserted mountain path, I followed the sound of water in hopes of reaching civilization. 
I eventually heard faint laughter echoing through the trees and felt relieved thinking they could help me out. Warily approaching them, it was difficult to see faces in the pitch-black darkness, but there were at least five people gathered around a roaring fire. Relief turned into horror as they pulled out weapons, an axe and some hunting knives. They were disfigured mountain men with twisted smiles who barked, Fresh meat! Suddenly realizing the predicament I was in, the bone from earlier being a warning sign, my heart raced and my survival instincts kicked in. I sprinted back through the woods with adrenaline surging through me as they chased after me, whooping like it was a game. Slicing through the trees to create obstacles, I tried putting distance between us until I came across an old forest shed, just barely keeping out of their grasp. I locked myself in and clumsily fashioned a makeshift weapon, a sharpened stick, hoping I would never have to use it. They hammered on the door, relentlessly taunting me. As they continued their assault on the door, my agile brain considered my options. Climbing up into the rafters of the shed, I positioned myself above the door in anticipation of buying some time once they broke in. The door finally gave way and the mountain men rushed in. The first two entered, and I kicked them down, taking advantage of their temporary confusion. Using my makeshift weapon, I stabbed it into one's leg to slow him down. The unexpected attack clearly annoyed them, their wrath intensified. The remaining ones charged at me with unsettling enthusiasm as I desperately tried to dodge and escape at every turn. Knowing there was no backup and my will to live being all that stood between me and a grisly fate, the intensity of the situation reached terrifying levels. The chasing mountain men seemed relentless and unstoppable as I narrowly persevered time after time. My exhaustion weighed heavy when reaching deeper into those dark woods, as shadows and noises melded into an endless nightmare of survival. Sounds of their growling laughter continued haunting me from an unseen distance. With each step, my world swayed between hopelessness and determination. My legs knew no rest as branches clawed at me, leaving bloody scratches behind. The moon offered little solace as the grim chase carried on with such ferocity that it seemed impossible it would ever end. Desperately searching for a way out, or some place to hide in the darkness, I stumbled upon a large rock and fell, tumbling off the trail. My body collided with the ground below, causing a searing pain to shoot through my ribs. Amidst the agony, I realized that I had unintentionally stumbled upon a small cave. With no time to lose, I quickly crawled into the cave, clutching my side and wincing against the pain. Inside was dark, damp, and musty, but at least it provided temporary cover from the relentless chase of the murderous mountain men. From my hidden spot in the cave, I watched as they searched for me with torches in their hands and gnashing teeth as they snarled in frustration. As minutes passed by, their pace slowed. It was clear that the mountain men were losing their patience and becoming desperate themselves. The opportunity to make use of this moment dawned on me this was the perfect time to make my escape. With slow breaths to steady myself against my continued pain, I waited until there was a considerable distance to ensure that they wouldn't notice me exiting the cave. Summoning every bit of strength within me, I forced myself out of my hiding and back onto my feet while bracing against the pain that threatened to consume me. Limping heavily, I began moving in the opposite direction of where the mountain men had headed. As I made my way through dark woods putting as much distance between me and them as possible, it became more apparent that finding help was now more crucial than ever. My phone's battery had drained during this chaotic ordeal leaving me with no means of contact or navigation. Suddenly, I came across a narrow dirt road that led towards what seemed like civilization a small wooden cabin. Hoping for some form of assistance or refuge within those walls, 
I approached its door and knocked with what little energy I had left. To my surprise, a frail elderly woman opened the door. She immediately saw the panic in my eyes and recognized the desperate situation I was in. She quickly ushered me inside, locking the door behind us. Out of breath from running from cannibals, I managed to tell her about the mountain men who were aggressively pursing me. Her face contorted into that of horror, and without hesitation, she picked up her phone and dialed the police. She informed the operator of my situation and requested assistance. The waiting for help felt like an eternity, but eventually, we heard the sirens approaching. The police stormed into her cabin, armed and prepared to face any danger that may come our way. The elderly woman and I were led out by law enforcement to their vehicles safely. As we were leaving, I began to think about the others who hadn't been as fortunate as me in escaping their grisly fate amidst those mountains. It has since been weeks after the terrifying night in those woods, but its haunting impact lingers on. Word of the cannibalistic mountain men spread fast and wide. Investigations are ongoing with several mountain men now in custody. While proper mourning can never truly take place for those who have lost their lives at their hands or even pay respects to those whose bodies never were found, it is comforting knowing that these heinous individuals are being ripped from society one by one ending this dark chapter for all potential innocent victims. This happened to me six weeks ago when I decided to take a solo trip to the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. My name is Walter Boggs, and I've worked as an accountant for the past ten years. The stress at work was getting too much, and I badly needed a break. On my first day at the remote mountain cabin, I chatted with a friendly local named Lyle Sumter who warned me about certain areas within the woods. He told me that hikers had gone missing previously, but I brushed off his comment as an attempt to scare a city boy like myself. The following day, during a hike, I came across the most bizarre sight, bones and clothing scattered across the forest floor. A chill went through my spine as I realized they were human remains. Just then, bird calls erupted around me, breaking my trance. Although it felt odd, time was passing quickly, so I moved forward, curiosity driving me further. While walking, I came across a heart-wrenching note from a person named Esther Bixby. She pleaded with her loved ones to find her because her kidnappers were coming back for her tonight. While unsettling on its own, what really disturbed me was the mention of people chained up in anticipation of being killed or worse. Feeling frantic and terrified for whoever might still be alive, I tried calling out for help but had no cell reception here deep in nature's embrace. Hesitant but determined to do something productive with the last hours of daylight remaining, I started looking for an abandoned structure nearby, the kidnappers then mentioned in the note. As twilight approached, tension growing around me thick as fog and darkness settled like heavy clouds upon every shadowy spot in sight. A creeping unease suddenly overwhelmed me as if my very instincts were urging me to leave this place immediately before something terrible unfolded or befell upon myself. However, ignoring this gut feeling that told me something would consume me whole if I didn't flee— I stumbled upon a dilapidated shack hidden in the thick forest. My heart raced as I knew this must be where they were keeping any remaining prisoners. With utmost caution, I approached and peered through a crack in the wooden doorway only to be greeted by weak moans of despair from the victims. Shaking with fear but fueled by rage, I kicked down the door. The kidnappers, however, were nowhere in sight. All that could be heard was shallow breathing and quiet weeping echoing amidst the blood-stained room. It suddenly became clear. Their objective wasn't just death, but the consumption of their wounded prey. 
They had kidnapped people to eat them alive as part of some deranged ritual or twisted fetish. While unchaining the victims Paul Arquette and Gloria Lambert, weak and disoriented from their gruesome captivity, I heard menacing growls just outside the shack. The sight that unfolded was horrifying. Monstrous figures with hulking bodies and wild eyes emerged from behind the trees. They had grotesque features with bone piercings, scars, and tattered clothes like something out of a sick movie. Their leader stood apart from the rest, silent, deadly, a tall brute who dwarfed even these behemoths beside him. His face bore a gruesome scar running from his right eye to his jawline, a testament to his barbaric nature. I knew I had to act quickly if we were to survive this nightmare. With Paul and Gloria free, I instructed them to sneak towards the woods while I distracted the cannibals. They nodded silently and moved away, grasping each other's hands tightly for support. As they disappeared among the trees, I grabbed a rusty crowbar from the shack and prepared myself for what was to come. The grotesque cannibals drew nearer to the shack, their gnarled fists clenched in anticipation. In an effort to catch them off guard, I let out a blood-curdling scream, tossed the crowbar at one of their heads, and bolted in the opposite direction. They scrambled after me, as was my plan, giving Paul and Gloria ample time to escape. Weaving in and out between trees, branches scratched my face and tore at my clothes as I raced desperately through the forest. The growls of the cannibals grew louder behind me. Somehow they managed to keep up with me despite their hulking frames. After what felt like hours of running, I came across a small stream and realized this was the perfect opportunity for a risky gambit. Hoping that my pursuers wouldn't notice, I leaped into its cold water and allowed it to carry me downstream. Moments later, I heard frustrated growls from the spot where I jumped. They'd fallen for it. Climbing ashore further down the bank, shivering from both fear and cold, I forced myself to continue. The thought of leaving Paul and Gloria behind unsettled me, but I knew our only chance was if at least one of us could find help. We were deep in uncharted territory with no cell phone service. It seemed like hope was almost non-existent. As luck would have it, I stumbled upon an emergency phone box within another hour of walking. Without hesitation or thinking about why it was there in such a remote location, I dialed 911. When the operator answered, I explained the situation as briefly as possible. Though skeptical at first, they took my report seriously and promised to send help right away. During the agonizing wait, I hid in a thicket close to the phone box, the biting cold forgotten in my adrenaline-fueled urgency. It wasn't long before I heard authoritative voices and approaching footsteps. The rescuers had finally arrived. With relief washing over me, I emerged from hiding and waved frantically at the approaching police officers. Once found by the authorities, it didn't take long for them to locate Paul and Gloria hiding deeper in the woods. Bruised, battered, but alive, they collapsed into each other's arms upon finally feeling safe. The police eventually uncovered that the cannibals were deranged individuals who formed an unholy alliance driven by an insatiable craving for human flesh. They'd been preying on innocence for a while now taking advantage of those who were lost and vulnerable. In the aftermath of this horrifying ordeal and after providing our statements, Paul, Gloria, and I were driven to safety. Even though we'd been through a nightmarish experience that would haunt us for years to come, we survived, an unfortunate rarity for those who crossed paths with those monstrous cannibals. As we left the forest behind us, both Paul and Gloria appeared worn down from their harrowing captivity. Seeing them safe and alive filled me with deep gratitude, knowing that somewhere out there remains a depraved group of individuals eager to prey on more victims left me unnerved. 
all three of us knew life would never again be the same after our close encounter with extreme horror. However, from here on out we'd remind ourselves never to wander too far from familiar territory, or lose hope in one another, even when facing frightening odds. As long as there is life in our bones, we'll treasure our survival and always remember the lost souls who fell into the grasp of those gruesome cannibals. This happened to me about five years ago. I had planned a hiking trip with my friend, Randy Katz, out in the lush wilderness of the Appalachian Mountains. We drove up to this small town called Elton in Virginia, where we stayed at a local inn before starting our adventure. The next day, as we wandered off the well-worn tourist path, the surrounding area began to feel more desolate and unforgiving yet somehow enchanting. The trees towered higher, blocking out any sunlight, and there was a faint forlornness in the air. I decided to take a picture on my old Polaroid camera when Randy fell behind. Suddenly, I heard him mumble something about leaving his car keys by some trees we had passed. Annoyed but concerned for our safety without communication or transportation, we turned back. After retrieving the keys and resuming our hike, it became evident that this detour changed our course considerably. The trail was barely visible, but our adventurous spirits prevailed, pushing us forward. A few hours into this unfamiliar path, a series of horrific scenes started to unfold before us. First, we stumbled upon what looked like a makeshift graveyard with small mounds of dirt and rocks scattered about. There were no tombstones or markers, just an eerie feeling that gripped us. As we continued through this uneasy terrain without cell phone reception, Randy started chatting nervously about meeting his girlfriend's parents for the first time last month. His attempt at light-hearted distraction fizzled quickly as a palpable stillness consumed the thick forest. Thus far, both of us wrote off our sinking feelings to nerves. But soon enough, our dread morphed into terror as we noticed a dismembered limb hanging from a tree branch. Shockingly real, it dangled over another pile of human remains scattered across the forest floor below it. Simultaneously bewildered and determined to escape, we picked up our pace. As we neared the hilltop, we heard a guttural growl behind us. Turning around cautiously, we spotted a group of large, menacing figures in the shadows. There were at least six of them, lurking just beyond the tree line. Their eyes radiated an eerie hunger that paralyzed us as they stepped out from the undergrowth. The sun danced upon their blood-spattered skin as their worn-out clothes clung to their malnourished bodies. Their mangled faces, distorted by merciless years of living in these woods, sent chills down our spines. A paralyzing fear set in and our throats clenched shut in sheer panic. They didn't speak a word. They only stared and grinned malevolently as if we were mere prey to them. Our sweat-drenched hands trembled as we tried to come up with a solution that didn't involve succumbing to their sinister desires. We felt trapped and helpless. Fighting back seemed futile against these beastly people who had clearly committed heinous acts and survived this long in their brutal domain. And then it struck me we could use our guns. Randy pulled out his revolver while I grabbed my rifle from my backpack. He whispered earnestly about trying to scare them off, but cautioned that if they saw us as a threat, things might escalate dangerously. The tension reached a breaking point when one of them spoke up for the first time. Thought you could wander round these mountains without consequences? He eyed us menacingly, chuckling under his breath. I glared back at the man. We didn't know this was your territory. We're just trying to get back home. I said, my voice shaking. Randy and I raised our guns, carefully aiming them at the leader of the group. 
The man snorted and spat on the ground, then he signaled for his group to move closer. The mountain men spread out, encircling us. I could see the weapons they carried, makeshift clubs, machetes, and even a rusty chainsaw. I knew in that moment calling for help was pointless. No one would hear us out here. You got some nerve coming out to our land, said another mountain man, his voice gruff and hoarse. His long, greasy hair obscured most of his face. We don't want any trouble, I replied firmly. We just want to leave. The men laughed wickedly. Not gonna happen, their leader sneered as he approached. This was our cue, Randy and I both fired warning shots into the air. The mountain men hesitated briefly but didn't back off. The leader raised his arm and motioned again for his followers to advance. Randy fired another round from his revolver while I aimed my rifle at the approaching figure with the chainsaw. It was terrifying. They didn't seem to be afraid of us or our guns. They kept moving closer despite our warnings. Desperate for some kind of solution, I remembered we still had our satellite phone in our backpacks. Maybe it had enough signal to call for help. It would be better than nothing. As Randy continued to fire warning shots at the mountain men, I quickly tossed him my rifle and began searching through my backpack for the phone. I found it and dialed 911 as quickly as possible. To my immense relief, the call connected. Hello? We're being attacked by a group of people in the mountains. Please send help, I yelled into the phone. Don't know if they heard me but there was no time to wait. The mountain men were still pressing in. With my hand shaking, I tossed the phone aside and gripped my rifle once more. Randy and I found ourselves back to back, facing each assailant as best as we could. As Randy continued exchanging shots with the mountain men, one slipped through his line of fire. The assailant lunged for me with a crude, sharpened stick. It impaled my leg and I screamed in agony, just as the man tried to drag me away. Randy noticed and acted fast. He aimed his revolver at the kidnapper's head and pulled the trigger. The shot echoed throughout the clearing and the man fell lifeless to the ground. Taking advantage of their shock, we seized our chance to flee. Limping and gritting my teeth in pain, Randy half-carried me as we ran back to where we had left our map and compass. We didn't stop running until we were sure the mountain men weren't following us. Our hope was that our call for help went through. Either way, all we could do now was try to make it back home alive. Thankfully, as luck would have it, when we made it down the mountain, we stumbled upon a group of search and rescue officers who must have heard our plea for help. Relief washed over us as they took us to safety. We recounted our harrowing ordeal with those cannibalistic mountain men, knowing that they remained a threat in those woods. We made it out alive that day, but even years later, I'll never forget those hungry eyes staring us down or how close Randy and I came to becoming their prey. We're now grateful for every day we live free from that terror lurking deep in the mountains a terror that almost claimed our lives. This happened to me some years ago when I went camping in the Appalachian Mountains. I'm a former Marine named Jonathan Creviston, and outdoor expeditions have always been my go-to escape from my bustling city life. On the first day of the trip, I joined a group of campers who had also seized this opportunity for an adventure. We set up our camp near a serene lake, surrounded by dense forest. The chirping of birds filled the air as we exchanged stories around the campfire. We hiked deeper into the wild, discovering various signs suggesting we weren't alone. One evening, after coming across what looked like a makeshift lean-to, Mike, 
A short man in his fifties from our group let slip that he was carrying a concealed pistol, just in case. On the fourth day, things took a chilling turn. One camper named Kim went missing. We launched multiple searches but found no sign of her. Frustration set in as we wondered what could have happened. Did she wander off and become lost? Was foul play involved? The next morning showed us how grim things could get when we found Mike brutally murdered, his body mutilated in ways that cannot be mentioned here. Shock spread across our faces as horrifying realization hit us. We were being hunted. Lucy, Mike's widow, cursed herself for not calling for help when we found that lean to earlier, but now it was far too risky to split up or leave anyone behind. The unknown menace lurking in these woods instilled panic in our group. It was evident that whoever was stalking us was no stranger to hunting humans. Some days later after walking miles without any encounters or incidents, Randy remarked about our plight ironically saying, Hey look on the bright side, at least this vacation is much more eventful than last year's fishing trip. We managed soft chuckles at this attempt at humor amid our terrifying ordeal. We carefully chose a spot to set up our next campsite near a cliff's edge. It seemed somewhat safe from potential ambushes, but we couldn't shake off the dread that had engulfed us, as if we were cornered prey. I pondered on the faces of the remaining group members. Cindy with her once bright red hair and lanky figure now seemed haggard and weary constantly peeking nervously at the woods. My own exhaustion was starting to wear me down as well. In what felt like a brief moment of peace, we heard distant voices in the woods. Were they other campers? Rangers? Or merely another group of unfortunate souls caught in this deadly game? As a new sense of determination filled us, we decided to try to make contact with those voices. We moved cautiously through the wilderness, hoping that strength in numbers could give us an advantage over our pursuers. As evening fell and darkness settled over the forest, we glimpsed movement through the trees' shadows lurking beyond our vision. I caught sight of one figure who appeared muscular and disheveled, carrying a rusty hunting knife. The malicious glint in his eyes told me all I needed to know. This was no friend or ranger, but rather one of our relentless stalkers. The chase ensued almost immediately. Gunfire echoed through the trees as Lucy fired a shot using Mike's confiscated pistol. Our adrenaline surged. It was fight or die here in the woods. We sprinted through the underbrush, hearts pounding as we tried to distance ourselves from the murderous figure. I stole a glance at Cindy and saw tears streaming down her face, but there was no time for comfort we had to keep moving. We jumped over fallen trees and swerved around thickets, our breaths growing ragged and sweat dripping down our faces. It wasn't until we stumbled upon an old cabin that we finally stopped. The wooden structure was in a poor condition its walls blanketed by moss and vines with cracked windows staring out like empty eye sockets. Mike ushered us inside, locking the door behind us. We didn't know if it would keep them out, but it was better than nothing. We waited in uneasy silence, struggling to catch our breaths while straining to catch any sound that might indicate their approach. After several agonizing moments of silence— we admitted that our phones were rendered useless by the forest's dense foliage, and our only course of action for now was to lie low. As the night wore on, sleep seemed like a long-forgotten luxury. We had no choice but to take turns keeping watch despite the oppressive smell of decay and the eerie creaks of the dilapidated building. During my turn on watch duty, my vigilance flagged as exhaustion began to take its toll. Suddenly, without warning, the cabin groaned and shook as if the very earth beneath it had come alive. A roar of splintering would shatter the silence as part of the back wall disintegrated in a shower of debris. 
with a gut-wrenching mix of rage and hunger gleaming in his eyes, one of their gang lunged at us from outside. Before I could react, Jack threw himself at the attacker in a desperate bid to save us all. The struggle was frantic and violent as they grappled with each other. Jack's courage was no match for the brute strength of the man who overpowered him and, with a sickening crunch, snapped Jack's neck like a twig. Terrified, we watched powerlessly as the ruthless killer then feasted on our friend's lifeless body. Blood and gore spattered onto the floor as he tore mercilessly at Jack's remains. Broken from witnessing the horrifying scene, Linda let out a muffled sob which swiftly drew his attention away from his gruesome meal. Recognizing our perilous situation, I urge everyone to leave the cabin immediately. As we burst through the front door into the darkness, I knew we had lost our only refuge. The dark forest swallowed us up once again and our frenzied flight resumed, but this time, with tears of grief for Jack clouding our vision, we bounded through the shadows, driven by fear and sorrow. Hours felt like days as we did our best to put any kind of distance between us and that cabin of horrors. Morning came and went, fatigue replaced with a glimmer of hope as we stumbled upon a dirt road. Sirens sounded in the distance heralding salvation, an approaching park ranger's truck came into focus. As the uniformed officers approached us weapons drawn after seeing our haggard and bloodied appearance we found ourselves unable to articulate our nightmarish ordeal or explain Jack's absence convincingly. The disbelieving rangers escorted us out of the woods before informing us that they'd scoured our campsite but found no evidence of Jack nor of any malicious attackers. The following days were spent recounting our experience to increasingly skeptical investigators. They implied that perhaps it had all been some elaborate prank or hallucination brought on by fatigue or dehydration. But deep in our hearts, as scarred and broken as they now were we knew the truth, somewhere out there in those twisted woods remained monstrous cannibalistic hunters, taking pleasure in the torment and slaughter of the unwary who strayed into their territory. And yet, for our own sanity, in time we suppressed and buried those vivid memories of Jack's grisly end. But I couldn't shake off the gnawing suspicion that we had left a part of ourselves in that forest, forever entwined with the darkness and terror lurking within its depths. This happened to me two years ago. I am Ted Greer, a freelance photographer from Chicago. I remember it like yesterday, driving on the winding roads of the isolated Appalachian region in Virginia. My intention was to capture the breathtaking mountain vistas on my camera. Little did I know what an ordeal awaited. Driving through the rustic countryside, I noticed a general store named Edgar's Supplies, at the crossroads. There I interacted with the owner and elderly man, burly with a bushy beard and nervous eyes. Edgar mentioned few tourists ventured into those wilds. He told me about several people who went missing in recent months, casual hikers and travelers, gone without a trace. Ignoring Edgar's warning, I proceeded deeper into the lush green forest. Hours later, somewhere off track, my car hit an animal carcass and broke down. Forced to walk on foot back towards civilizational signs, I felt an inexplicable sinking feeling within me. The sun dipped beneath the tree line when I stumbled onto an abandoned campsite near a river bank. Three tents, untouched for days with smoldering embers in the fire pit something was amiss here. Freaked out by the eerie atmosphere, I decided not to stay there and followed the river bank. While walking along the river, I noticed odd markings on trees and ground that didn't seem natural. It was as if someone deliberately carved them. Skeptical of their significance, I ignored them and pushed forward. Later that night, 
While searching for a safe place to rest near some boulders, I heard rustling in bushes nearby. At first glance, it looked like wild animals lurking around for food. However, when they came into view under moonlight, they were no ordinary animals six grotesque beings squatted around a heap of bones and flesh. Malformed creatures covered in filthy rags with gaunt faces and large eyes, they resembled mountain men. Gnawing on human bones and gorging on their cannibalistic feast, their teeth dripped with blood. My stomach churned at the gruesome sight. Hiding behind a boulder to avoid being noticed, I pulled out my phone to call for help but found it had no service in this remote territory. Peering over the boulder's edge as they devoured the remains of their latest kill, I stumbled, snapping a twig beneath my feet. The creatures instantly stopped their feast and stared towards me with an unsettling focus. Realizing they had heard me, I panicked and bolted back to the river, trying to follow its course toward the nearest town. As I sprinted through the woods, thoughts raced through my mind Edgar's warning about the missing people and how I should never have ventured into these desolate hills. The sound of disfigured mountain men on my heels was a relentless nightmare. Gradually, breathless, I felt a burning sensation in my leg muscles and realized that running wasn't enough to evade them. Their grotesque nature lent them unusual speed and agility in this harsh landscape. My eyes drifted towards an overturned car half-buried in mud beside the river. In that fleeting moment, a risky thought crossed my mind. Submerging myself in the muddy water around the vehicle might be my only chance of escape. Without hesitation, I dived into the freezing water and held my breath near the submerged car while camouflaging myself with mud and sticks from below. The horrifying faces of those cannibalistic demons almost within reach arrived at my hiding spot, sniffing vigorously searching for their fleeing prey. With controlled breaths, I listened as they grunted something that sounded like a primitive language amongst themselves while probing for me in every direction. After what felt like an eternity trapped underwater between life and death, they retreated into the forest their monstrous voices fading in the distance. Cautiously, I emerged from the water, gasping for air when confident they had left. Soaked and shivering uncontrollably, I knew I still needed to find my way out of these cursed hills. As I cautiously began down the river bank once more, mindful of what lay hidden within those woods, I spotted someone bobbing along the water. I looked closer and realized the person in the water was a fellow hiker who seemed lost. As they approached, I could see the terror etched on their face. Deciding to help them, I reached out my hand and helped pull them to shore. What's your name? I asked as they coughed up the river water. Alex, they croaked, visibly shaken. We need to get out of here. There are dangerous mountain men looking for us. I explained without going into grotesque details. But my phone has no service. I can't call for help. Alex stared at their useless device. Neither does mine. We have to find our way out on foot. We both agreed to follow the river, hoping it would lead us to civilization. As we continued, we found ourselves facing obstacles that slowed our progress from steep cliffs that took considerable effort to navigate, to thick brush that hindered our movement. Each day, our bodies grew exhausted from constant exertion, while our nerves remained on edge as we feared the possibility of another grisly encounter. One afternoon, as we stopped to drink from a small stream ahead and plan our next move, Alex spotted a group of people hiking along the opposite bank. Relief washed over us as we realized that these were not the dreaded mountain men but resembled ordinary campers or hikers like ourselves. Desperate for assistance and safety in numbers, I shouted across the river trying to catch their attention. Hearing my call for help, they stopped and waved at us before carefully making their way towards us. 
after further examination and catching glimpses of gear and camping equipment, it was apparent that we had found fellow hikers with whom we could share our ordeal and ask for directions. Introductions were made swiftly after they crossed over to join us. There were four in total, Sam, Lucy, John, and Emma. We relayed our story and the danger that awaited them if they continued in the direction we had fled. They listened, their faces growing pale as they took in our harrowing experience. It turned out their group was out for a weekend adventure, and they informed us that we weren't far from a nearby highway. Resolving to leave the mountains together at once, we embarked on a challenging trek with our newly formed group where safety trumped fear. We made our way through dense foliage and treacherous terrain, constantly checking behind us to ensure we were clear of the horrifying mountain men. As the sun began to set over the horizon, we finally reached level ground and spotted the highway in the distance. We collectively sighed in relief. Our journey to reach safety had nearly come to an end. Just as we approached the edge of the forest, I halted and turned around one final time. The invisible presence of those grotesque hunters still lingered in my thoughts, a ghastly reminder of what could have been. Together, we walked along the highway with renewed determination as cars zipped past. Upon reaching a nearby gas station, Alex and I contacted authorities to report our horrifying ordeal and warn others venturing into that treacherous terrain. The police listened intently and promised action would be taken. Grateful for our lives and eager to return home after several days in terror's grip, Alex and I said our goodbyes to Sam, Lucy, John and Emma before heading our separate ways. With each step away from the nightmare-tainted hills that held memories of pursuing horrors close behind us, I found comfort in knowing I had narrowly escaped from becoming another gruesome tale told by survivors like myself. As my life continued on its course in calmer waters free from monstrous adversaries or ill-fated hikes, every so often my thoughts wandered back to those cannibalistic mountain men now buried deep within my memory. I felt fortunate to still be alive and longed for closure to know that the gruesome threat was eradicated by the authorities' intervention. Though I never asked for updates, a chilling sense of uncertainty simply lingered in my heart for I knew that beyond the quiet embrace of civilization, the shadows of twisted beings still roamed twisted hills. This happened to me six years ago, while traveling through the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. I had always enjoyed hiking, so I thought nothing of exploring a remote trail during my weekend getaway. My name is Daniel Seaver, a 33-year-old mechanic from Pittsburgh. The town at the base of the mountain had only a few hundred residents, all of whom seemed to know each other. I met two other hikers in town, Maya and Sam, a married couple originally from Maine. We agreed to venture out into the wilderness together. The first day of our hike was uneventful. We shared stories about our lives. Maya was a nurse, and Sam was an electrician. We laughed together about our common frustrations and listened attentively when one of us shared something more personal. It wasn't until the second day that we stumbled upon something strange. An empty campsite lay abandoned, belongings scattered around as if someone had left in a hurry, or worse, been dragged away. Concerned, we decided to stick closer together and became more cautious as we continued hiking. When night fell, we gathered around a fire for warmth and comfort. The full darkness enveloped us as an unsettling quiet settled around our camp. Maya spoke up first, stating how weird it felt to be surrounded by these silent woods. Sam agreed, unease painting his features. A sudden gunshot pierced through the silent night air like a thunderclap, jolting us from our quiet moment. Panic set in as we scrambled for cover 
hiding behind nearby trees and bushes for safety. Before my eyes could adjust to the darkness, I saw a hulking figure emerging from the shadows, heavily built and donning ragged clothes stained with what appeared to be blood. The figure held a rifle and scanned the area intently but said nothing. Fear pulsed through me as I clutched my small pocket knife tightly. I knew I had seen a monster. This being was certainly no ordinary man, and its viciousness was palpable in the moonlight as it stalked the surrounding forest. While Maya, Sam, and I managed to avoid detection for the moment, we knew that we couldn't hide forever. With tense whispers, we agreed to swiftly move through the forest, hoping to outrun whatever menace hunted us. We knew that splitting up would be dangerous, so we clung to each other as we plunged into the darkness. As we moved silently through the dense woods, I couldn't help but frantically look over my shoulder, convinced that at any moment I would see this monstrous figure charging towards us with the hunger of a ruthless predator. We heard the distant sound of shots occasionally ringing out, an unsettling reminder of our impending doom. However, our luck seemed to have run out when Sam let out a pained grunt after stepping on a sharp rock. His yell echoed beyond the trees, surely catching the attention of our relentless pursuer. My heart raced as I sensed danger close by. We didn't have time to tend to Sam's wound— he bit his lip hard and hobbled alongside us as we hurried along, desperately seeking a way out. The looming threat spurred us on, adrenaline replacing fatigue in our battered bodies. In the distance, we spotted what looked like an old building partially hidden amongst the trees, a possible refuge for us to hide in and regroup. Out of options and exhausted beyond measure, we decided to make a break for it. As we began our final sprint towards safety, I couldn't suppress a feeling deep in my gut that something about this situation was disturbingly familiar. As the old building grew closer, we noticed its decayed walls and broken windows. The place seemed abandoned, and though it wasn't an ideal hiding spot, we couldn't be choosy. As I helped Sam limp towards it, I couldn't shake the familiar feeling that haunted me since we started running. I pushed open the creaky door, grimacing as it made a loud noise that could easily alert the mountain men following us. We entered cautiously and found ourselves in a room filled with debris and remnants of furniture. Carefully, we moved deeper into the building, feeling for hidden dangers in the dark. That's when they came, the mountain men. They were tall and burly figures with long disheveled hair and tattered clothes carrying weapons as brutal as their appearance. A multitude of scars decorated their rugged faces, testifying to the life of violence they led. Those men had no trace of humanity left in them searching only to satisfy their insatiable hunger for human flesh. Sam let out a quiet groan as they entered the room. He collapsed onto the floor from exhaustion and pain. The thud he made caught their attention instantly. My heart sank for a moment before instincts kicked in. There was nothing else to do but run. As I sprinted through the crumbling building with every ounce of energy left in me, their guttural growls echoed through the corridors, closing in relentlessly. Sam's injury made it impossible for him to stand up and battle against his imminent fate. Just as I thought all was lost— a ray of hope appeared in the form of a narrow window leading outside. Without a second thought, I leaped out headfirst into the cold night air. Seconds later, crashing sounds ensued behind me. These cannibalistic mountain men had one goal in mind catching their prey no matter what it takes. As I made my descent towards some bushes below, I glimpsed one of them coming to the window to pursue me. Fortune favored me when I realized they struggled to fit through the small gap. This gave me precious moments to get away and find help before they figured a way out. I knew that Sam and I couldn't do this alone. We needed help. It was near impossible to call anyone in this remote area, 
as signal strength was scarce, but I had to try. With hands shaking from fear and exertion, I pulled my phone from my pocket and dialed the emergency number. As it rang, I kept moving, refusing to stop in fear of being caught. Miraculously, someone picked up on the other end. Barely able to catch my breath, I relayed our situation as quickly as possible. While waiting for their arrival, I hid behind some dense foliage just away from the building, lying low. The mountain men eventually exited the structure after finding an alternative route. They sniffed the air, feral eyes scanning around for any signs of prey. My heart pounded violently, but I didn't dare move. Hours later, sirens pierced the silence like a beacon of hope cutting through the darkness of despair. As law enforcement officers approached cautiously, weapons drawn, they found Sam miraculously still alive, grievously injured yet clinging on to life with every ounce of strength he had. The mountain men scattered into the depths of the forest as if they'd dissolved into the shadows themselves. Their monstrous figures vanished while the officers attended to Sam's injuries and called for backup. Though none of us could have anticipated those terrifying events, we lived to see another day, all because of courage and determination in those moments where it mattered most. As days passed into weeks, my mind often wandered back to that harrowing night when we scrambled for survival against bloodthirsty fiends masquerading as human beings themselves. Authorities continued their search and investigation regarding the cannibalistic mountain men. In the aftermath, a veil of bitter reminders slipped over our lives like an invisible shadow. Memories of that dreadful encounter haunted us in different ways Sam's wounds healed but left gruesome scars as a constant reminder of the night, whereas my psyche bore the marks of a familiar darkness I couldn't quite place. Regardless, we prevailed and emerged from this nightmare— as changed people who will never forget how close we came to death's door that fateful night or the whispered prayers for rescue we held so dearly in our hearts. This happened to me five years ago, just before the terrifying ordeal took off. Demetrius Nolan invited me, Joey Greenberg, on a weekend trip to Huntington Lake in California. Little did I know that my life was about to change forever. Demetrius, his cousin Elsa Porter, and I embarked on a road trip from San Francisco with high hopes of relaxation and hiking through the verdant landscape. Huntington Lake is known for its tranquil waters and towering pine trees that surround the area. The weather was perfect, sunny, yet accompanied by a gentle breeze that rustled the leaves of the swaying redwoods. We reached our cabin after sunset, a cozy wooden building infused with the earthy scent of pine. After cracking open a few jokes about each other's driving skills, we settled in for the evening with a hearty meal that Elsa cooked for us. The second day arrived brought with it a sense of calmness as we explored trails surrounding our cabin. Demetrius' laughter echoed through the woods as we shared stories from our pasts. I remembered my days growing up in a small Midwestern town where nothing ever happened. But as we continued our hike, we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite littered with tattered clothes, broken gear, and crimson stains. The sight ignited an uneasiness within us. Something or someone had caused not only chaos but seemingly vanished an entire group of campers. On edge now, we retraced our steps but soon found ourselves lost among an unknown trail shrouded in thick fog. Sudden rustling distracted us and footsteps approached from behind footsteps that didn't quite fit any human or animal gait we knew of. A figure loomed ahead, tall and burly with ragged clothes that hung loosely over his sunken torso. His eyes were hollow pits of darkness. We stood paralyzed as he emitted guttural grunts, saliva dripping from his cracked lips. Then, out of the fog, 
more of these creatures appear to group that can only be described as cannibalistic mountain men closing in on us. Their matted hair hung over foreheads etched with malice and hunger, clutching crudely made weapons ready to end our lives. Cornered and terrified for our lives, Elsa tried reaching for her phone to call for help, but there was no signal in this desolate corner of the woods. The once innocent invitation by Demetrius now seemed like a trap set by vultures, unseen forces to lure us into their claws. Our humorous banter had transformed into desperate screams for help as we were left with no way to escape these sinister creatures or even defend ourselves against their blades and clubs. Frantically searching for some sort of reprieve, I scoured the ground for any weapon. My fingers clutched a sharp rock as Demetrius stood beside me, breaths heavy with fear but utterly determined not to surrender our lives. Tears filled my eyes as I prayed for a miracle within arm's reach while the agonizing sound of craving bellows ripped through the once peaceful forest. Elsa's voice cracked as she pleaded with her hunter. Please, she sobbed softly. What is it you want from us? Can't we just go back the way we came? The monstrous figure lurched forward instead, bearing jagged teeth and emitting a haunting growl that mocked her every syllable. Desperation took over as we realized that neither reasoning nor escaping would bring a quick end to our inexplicable situation. The realization dawned on us that we needed to confront our attackers, and the only way was to face them head on. We glanced at each other, knowing for the first time in our lives that teamwork and trust were essential to surviving these abominably violent mountain men. These beasts in human form continued their predatory advance, their muscular bodies indicating years of survival through savagery. As if sensing our determination, the men exchanged ominous looks before resuming their grisly pursuit. Elsa, Demetrius, and I huddled together, backs pressed against one another as the mountain men formed a circle around us. We clung onto rocks and tree branches, makeshift weapons that we hoped would prolong our lives for just a few crucial moments. Demetrius locked his terrified eyes onto mine and gave a slight nod as if to say, now or never. We launched ourselves at the nearest men, swinging our makeshift weapons with frenzy. Gritting my teeth in determination, I managed to connect a solid blow to one man's temple as Elsa took down another by swiping his legs from under him. Despite our best efforts and the adrenaline coursing through our veins, we knew time was running out. It was then that we heard it, the unmistakable thuds of footsteps approaching from behind us. My heart lurched into my throat as I realized more of these malevolent beings were swarming in like wolves, ready for an easy feast. As the space between us and the mountain men rapidly shrank, Elsa cried out in sheer terror. It echoed through the forest, punctuated by the merciless growls of our attackers. In a final attempt at self-preservation, Demetrius took off sprinting in no particular direction with Elsa and me not far behind. Our desperate cries must have reached someone, for just as my legs were about to give out from exhaustion, the sound of sirens filled the forest. The melodic wail was beautiful and horrifying all at once. We could no longer tell whether it was coming to save us or deliver us to more gruesome fate. Emerging from the pulsating darkness, a tireless search party of police officers and park rangers had clothed themselves in our would-be liberators. Their presence startled the murderous mountain men just enough for us to break free and commandeer their attention. The officers immediately sprung into action, training their guns on the attackers and yelling commands for them to stand down. Remarkably, some of our pursuers chose instant surrender. But not all. Others attempted to flee back into the forest, or charged headlong toward them with malice in their eyes. The raging screams and gunfire mixed into a cacophony that will haunt me forever. Once the chaos dissipated, 
We clung together in shock as medical personnel ushered us onto stretchers and administered first aid. The horrifying ordeal had come to an end. But even with these vicious mountain men behind bars, or dead, a sense of closure eluded us, replaced by dreadful memories etched indelibly in our minds. As we rode away in ambulances, Demetrius seemed lost in thought while holding Elsa's hand. We can only cling to one another now, thankful for our lives even if they'd been irrevocably damaged by this harrowing event. For as long as I live, I know I'll never forget those terrifying predators hidden within the forest's snaking tendrils. Nor will I ever forget Demetrius' stalwart courage that might well have spared my life. But above all else, I'll never forget that desperate cry that seemed to pierce time and space alike. My grateful heart's own call for help, even if salvation's bittersweet taste lingers as a grim reminder of the night we faced the most unimaginable horrors. This happened to me a couple of years ago, in the dense forests of West Virginia. I'm Hank Grimes, a freelance photographer captivated by nature. Seeking solace from a recent breakup, I ventured deep into the mountains to capture its untouched beauty. Little did I know it would become my most terrifying experience. At my first campsite, I met another hiker named Melanie Duncan. An experienced backpacker on her maiden trip to these mountains, she struggled with a torn map and muttered about potentially getting lost. Over a campfire that night, we shared stories of our adventures and bonded over our common love of the outdoors. The conversation was peppered with light-hearted jokes that chased away any lingering sadness from my personal life. The following day, as we continued along the trail, we stumbled upon what appeared to be an abandoned campsite. Strewn clothing and half-eaten provisions littered the area, and there were signs of struggle in the dirt. Melanie's uneasiness grew. She said she had read online rumors of people disappearing mysteriously in these mountains, but had brushed them off as fables. We pressed on cautiously, every rustle making us jump. Sunset painted the sky as we crossed paths with a disheveled man named Isaac Meyer who joined us for shelter at our next resting point. Nights in the woods were serene but eerie all at once. As Isaac stared into the flickering fire, he revealed his reason for being here, searching for his brother who had vanished months ago while hiking this very trail. At first light after a sleepless night, we discovered one of our bags had been tampered with. A pocket knife lay nearby that definitely didn't belong to us. Isaac clenched his fists in anger. Those damn mountain people! Isaac recounted sinister tales involving local hunters turned cannibals living off travelers they ensnared deep in these woods. Fear gripped our minds, but we thought it'd be riskier to try and find our way back without Isaac's help. We armed ourselves with sticks and knives, more paranoid with each ominous shadow cast by the trees. Navigating unforgiving terrain led us to a putrid stench. Horrified, we found the source, a decomposing human foot. Our panic increased, nausea and a primal urge to flee fighting for dominance in our guts. Unable to ascribe the event to anything else, Melanie finally admitted she was beginning to believe Isaac's stories. But we trudged on. If all went well, we thought, tomorrow's hike would take us out of these treacherous mountains. As twilight descended once more, I scoured the dark woods for kindling when an enormous figure loomed over me, far too tall and wide to be human, draped in tattered clothing, face obscured by wild hair. Its grotesque teeth resembled rusty nails. Terrified, I scrambled back and fled toward camp where I described the encounter. Isaac's expression darkened while Melanie clutched her hiking pole tighter. Sounds like one of them cannibals, Isaac growled. We gotta move now. 
otherwise. We hastily packed before traipsing into the gloom. Unable to articulate my concern that there were others like that man-beast creature lurking nearby, my fear mounted. Suddenly, a guttural yell reverberated through the darkness. An ambush erupted as twisted mountain dwellers charged towards us. Terrified and outnumbered, we fought with every ounce of strength we could muster. Run! Melanie shouted as she swung her hiking pole towards one assailant's head. We sprinted away frantically as other malevolent figures loped after us, dodging fallen branches yet hearing their relentless pursuit gaining ground. Seconds feeling like an eternity of non-stop adrenaline coursing through our veins. Weaving through the trees, sharp rocks jab at our ankles, and unseen branches scraped at our faces. My heart nearly leapt out my chest with each added exertion, but I refused to quit. I couldn't endanger Isaac and Melanie any further. I could faintly hear Isaac's breathing behind me, deep gurgles coming from his tired lungs. Melanie was nowhere to be seen or heard, but we couldn't risk stopping in fear of being caught. The forest began to thin out, and we found ourselves approaching the edge of a cliff. There was no choice. We had to face these monsters head-on. Isaac and I prepared ourselves, ready for the impending wave of cannibalistic mountain dwellers. Our clothes ragged, faces smeared with dirt and dried blood. It was then that we noticed Melanie at the base of the cliff, her expression full of rage as she clashed metal against flesh. She had found a way around their approach and was yielding her hiking pole like a fierce warrior, giving no quarter to these sickening beings. Isaac mustered the strength to call out to her, his voice hoarse and strained. Melanie! There's too many. Get out of there. She barely acknowledged us due to her focused struggle. She kept fighting with rapid strikes and loud grunts echoing in the air. She was determined not to become another one of their victims. Despite their monstrous size and strength, it appeared that their grotesque teeth and talon-like nails were their main weapons. Decay lingered on their jagged edges. Every time one fell to Melanie's forceful blows, more seemed to emerge from the shadows. Sensing that our attempts to flee would be futile now that they were closing in, Isaac lunged towards one of them just as it approached him from behind, seemingly catching him off guard. Its body collided with a nearby tree with an unsettling crack, and Isaac fell to his knees, clutching his injured arm. Grimacing in pain, he declared through gritted teeth, We gotta end this now. I nodded in agreement, knowing full well there was no turning back. The only way out of this nightmare was to fight our way through. I grabbed a large stone and ran toward the nearest assailant. It seemed to snarl with delight as I approached, like a twisted kind of glee at the prospect of a new meal. Ignoring my fear, I brought the rock down upon the being's head, bones shattered under the force of my strike, and continued fighting alongside Melanie and Isaac. Time had ceased existing. We fought on instinct alone as the twilight darkness began subtly fading into premature dawn. Our violent stand against the advancing horde continued with no end in sight. They were relentless. Those who fell were swiftly replaced by others who crawled from the dense shadows. Our bodies ached with exhaustion when we finally managed to break away from the chaos and found ourselves backtracking along our original path. As we neared our destination, it felt as though an eternity had passed since we first embarked on what should have been an uneventful hike. Just as hope seemed within reach, a guttural voice pulsed through the air. It mattered not that they could not muster words. Their intent was clear enough either way. Outnumbered and with injuries taking their toll, we turned to stare death itself in its terrible eyes. It was then that Isaac took matters into his shaking hands. He glanced at Melanie and me before stepping forward towards them defiantly. With a guttural cry of his own, 
You will never bother us again. He charged straight ahead, his weakened body using any remaining adrenaline for a final push to confront their leader. The sounds that followed will haunt me forever. The tortured screams as flesh was torn and bones cracked under the violence. Melanie and I watched in horror, paralyzed with fear, as the gnarled hands reached for Isaac's throat. We couldn't help him. To do so would mean certain death for all of us. As much as it pained our every fiber, we grabbed one another's hands tightly and ran away from this desecrated forest unseen. Isaac's final, brave decision gave us a chance, a chance to survive. We would never forget him or the monstrous dwellers that claimed his life those unforgettable days we spent lost in the treacherous mountains. This happened to me a few summers ago, when I was invited to join some friends on a hiking trip in the remote Appalachians. My name is Stanley O'Reardon, an ordinary guy who works as a software engineer in the city. The fresh air and physical exercise sounded like the perfect escape from my mundane life. The hiking group consisted of my best friend, Rupert Gauntlet, and our acquaintances Wallace DeWire and Madge Greta. As one could imagine, we exchanged stories about past hiking experiences and shared interesting topics of discussion. It created a sense of camaraderie amongst us. The first day of hiking proceeded without any incident, and we set up camp well before nightfall to welcome the peaceful surroundings that enveloped us. That eerie calmness was soon broken by the gruesome discovery nearby. An abandoned campsite with its tent ripped to shreds, dried blood spatters visible all over the scattered belongings. This shocking scene made it clear that we were not alone in these woods. Putting our unease aside, we decided it was safest to continue along our planned route and report our finding at the next opportunity. But even with our unwavering resolve, we could not shake off the unnerving feeling that something dangerous lurked just beyond our perception. We pressed on deeper into those intimidating mountains, conversing less and listening more intently for any mysterious sounds or movements that might prompt concerns for our safety in this vast wilderness. During this tense trek, Wallace received a small cut from a bramble that needed attention. Otherwise, we'd risk infection if left untreated. As he cleaned his wound by the trickling stream, now merely several steps away from where we stood, a sudden reality overtook us as we witnessed an unknown man emerging from behind an ancient tree trunk. Tall and menacingly muscular, with coarse tangled hair cascading down his back like twisted vines, the man had an eerie presence that sent shivers down our spines. He hobbled slightly yet not enough to slow his pursuit. We were standing directly in his path. Without a moment's hesitation, we abandoned Wallace and the others to their fates, prioritizing our safety over assisting those who needed help. Our frantic run deeper into the maze of trees continued as we heard distant screams signaling the blood-curdling demise of our friends. As we caught our breath, we stumbled upon a concealed entrance to a narrow clearing. The fear began to wash over us like torrential rain when we realized that piles of bones, clothing, and the remnants of shoes were scattered throughout the eerie clearing. Cornered with no escape and racked with guilt for leaving our friends behind, Rupert nervously cracked a joke to lighten the mood but could barely laugh at his own words. The gravity of the situation had taken its toll. With little time left to formulate an action plan before nightfall, we carefully studied our surroundings for any chance of evading those monstrous mountain dwellers who were surely still upon us. They had no intention of allowing us to escape, alive or otherwise. The precipitous cliffs nearby provided us but one grim opportunity for salvation— scale their treacherous slopes or die trying. With no other choice left, we started climbing, 
fingers grasping at roots and rocks while fighting off vertigo as the ground shrunk further beneath us. Above the rugged tree line, through the wind and fog that clung to these godforsaken peaks like a shroud concealing sinister secrets, those monstrous beings found us once more. Perched silently on jagged cliffs like deranged birds of prey, they eyed their quarry impassively before making their move. Climbing higher and higher, we tried to catch our breaths. Our hands bled from the sharp stones and roots we clung to, but we didn't dare look down or reflect upon the horror that had chased us into the steep terrain. We saw dark shapes darting in the trees below, men twisted by cannibalism ravenous in their cruel hunger. Suddenly, without warning, one of the monstrous hunters lunged at Rupert from a hidden perch further up the cliff. It sunk its yellow and rotten teeth into his neck, tearing out a chunk of flesh as he screamed in agony. I could hear their sinister laughter echoing in my ears. My heart pounded, and I knew I had to act fast. Overwhelmed with fear, I made a decision that still haunts me. I let go of Rupert's hand, watching in terror as he fell. The cannibals surrounded his lifeless body below us, feasting on him like ravenous animals. As much as I longed for rescue or help, there was no one to call out to, no one who would hear us over the cacophony of wind and distance. Our dwindling strength and lack of climbing expertise created an urgency that only quick thinking could countenance. Soon enough, the cannibals began their gruesome ascent towards me. Determined to avoid Rupert's grisly fate, I noticed a cluster of fallen boulders strewn along a narrow ledge beneath my trembling feet. Using all my remaining strength, I pushed three massive rocks off the side of the cliff just as one cannibal closed in on my position. The impact shattered bones and crushed organs. None of the mountain dwellers survived. Exhaustion and relief mixed together in an intoxicating cocktail. For a moment, it almost dulled my despair and grievous guilt at leaving Rupert behind, my friend gone forever. With no hope of finding help on the mountains, I resumed my treacherous ascent, fueled by a singular need to escape the nightmarish desolation beneath. The sun dipped below the horizon, and little by little, dark shadows covered the land like an abyssal tide. Somehow, when dawn broke over the mangled trees, I found myself at the summit of the mountain. Exhausted yet grateful to be alive, I pushed away my guilt one final time and looked around. Spread before me was a vast valley untouched by the monstrous cannibals, a haven where I could find refuge and mourn my loss. Desperation and survival had propelled me through that unholy ordeal, and though my friends were no more, I could ensure their sacrifice was not in vain by sharing this disturbing tale warning those naive enough to wander into the domain of those grotesque devourers of human flesh. As I made my way down towards this newfound bastion of safety, Rupert's desperate eyes haunted my every step. I whispered apologies for their untimely deaths, even though nobody would ever hear them but me, promising to honor their memories by staying alive. It has been years since that harrowing experience— New friendships have blossomed in the shadow of loss. Life has returned to some semblance of normalcy. However, the guilt remains, a painful reminder of choices made in terror. I often look back on that day with mixed emotions. In darker moments, I question if there was another way, a better option that should have been pursued more ferociously. Yet such inquiry yields little consolation. It is a futile dance performed upon an unforgiving stage. Nonetheless, fate affords me a chance at redemption, a prospect set against stark contrast to animate absolution. For now, armed with knowledge and burdened with sanctimonious purpose, I can issue a clarion call to future generations. Beware! Do not stumble into forgotten valleys where the line between man and monster blurs like a gory mist. 
where despair lies tangled in the roots and terror strains against the very air. And as I wander down a winding path towards the horizon before me, I whisper farewell to my fallen friends, bravest of souls who linger still, frozen in memory's cold embrace. A solitary tear slides down my cheek. It carries with it the vestiges of an awful past that shall never dare return. This happened to me a few summers ago. I wish I could forget it. I was visiting my buddy, Samuel Thompson, in the small town of Bearsville, Idaho. Sam and I reconnected after years of losing touch, which made the notion of seeing him all the more enticing. Upon arrival, Sam told me about these strange disappearances that were plaguing his town two people had gone missing within the past month alone. We decided to set out and explore the nearby forests, but deep down, I was skeptical about anything extraordinary happening to us. Before we embarked on our journey, Sam's girlfriend, Katie O'Malley, insisted on joining us. As we ventured into the forest chatting about our lives, Sam shared a personal story about his struggling marriage. We sympathized with him and tried to crack jokes to keep the mood light. The deeper we went, the terrain changed from a simple forest landscape to rocky cliffs and dense fog. Despite my lack of athletic prowess, hiking seemed quite enjoyable until we stumbled across something horrific. A mutilated body lied in a pool of blood by the roots of a tree totally mangled beyond recognition. My instinct screamed for escape as I imagined countless scenarios of what had transpired there. Guys, we need to leave. We must report this back, Katie cried out. However, Sam didn't seem quite convinced. We should investigate further find out who might have done this. I reluctantly agreed, feeling compelled to uncover what happened before something worse came for us or anybody else in Bearsville. We pressed on cautiously, fear lingering in every step. Suddenly, a guttural growl echoed throughout the mist-veiled woods an indescribable noise that sent chills down our spines. Out of nowhere emerged a group of grim-faced and barely clothed mountain men bearing wicked grins revealing their decayed teeth. Towering over us was their presumed leader a frightening man with scars across his face and empty, merciless eyes. His muscle-bound frame exuded an ominous aura, partly concealed under a filthy tunic. The bloodthirsty group carried a mishmash of weapons rifles, hunting knives, and even crudely made bows. As Sam and I scrambled to protect Katie from the menacing horde, one captured and disarmed us. Our desperate pleas for mercy went unheeded as the villains sinisterly observed us their human prey being served on a silver platter. With no cell reception in this desolate area, we couldn't even call for backup. Hoping to spark a shred of empathy in our captors, Katie managed to mumble. Please don't hurt us. We didn't mean any harm. The monstrous leader laughed malevolently before responding in a low guttural voice. You pathetic outsiders think you can wander into our territory without consequences? Sam angrily retorted as he spat blood from his busted lip. You won't get away with this. You'd be surprised at just what we could get away with. The sadistic man sneered back menacingly. As we braced ourselves for the death that seemed inescapable amidst these cannibalistic mountain dwellers, adrenaline surged through my veins while my heart raced. The anticipation of our demise gnawed at my sanity, as I recognized my failure to recollect any faces or names among these monstrous beings. Determined to defy them somehow, I attempted a risky maneuver— fighting off one of our captors to retrieve the rifle he had inadvertently placed within my reach. With my heart pounding, I lunged towards the rifle and managed to grab it just as our captor tried to kick it out of reach. 
I scrambled to my feet, pointing the weapon at him. The mountain men hesitated, unsure of what to do next. Run! I shouted at Sam and Katie, and we sprinted away while the mountain men watched, still unsure of how to react. As we raced through the woods, we found ourselves in a landscape that had become increasingly unfamiliar. The trees towered above us like giants, with tangled roots obstructing our path at every turn. Our once peaceful mountain getaway had transformed into a living nightmare. We ran for hours, trying to put as much distance as we could between ourselves and our captors. But the sounds of the cannibals pursuing us never seemed far away. Finally, completely exhausted, we decided to find a hiding spot and catch our breath. Nestled behind a small outcropping of rocks, we listened intently for any signs of nearby danger. Man, if only we had some cell reception, Sam muttered nervously. That's when it hit me I remembered seeing a weathered old payphone near the entrance of this desolate area when we first arrived. It was an outdated method of communication, but it was our only chance to call for help. We need to get back to that payphone near the entrance. I whispered urgently to Sam and Katie. It's worth a shot. As cautiously as possible, we retraced our steps through the horrific terrain, keeping low and silent in an effort to avoid drawing any unwanted attention to ourselves. As time ticked away agonizingly slowly, every sound in the forest seemed amplified, from the rustling leaves beneath our feet to each snap of twigs in the distance. After what felt like an eternity navigating through those woods that offered nothing but dread seeping into our bones, we eventually spotted the dilapidated structure housing the payphone. I could hardly believe it still existed in such a desolate area. I quickly dialed 911 and frantically whispered our situation to the operator on the other end. The gravity of what had just occurred was hitting me like a weight on my chest, but I fought against the urge to break down. We needed help right away. A sheriff's deputy arrived within an hour, his face etched with concern as he listened to our account. Sam, Katie, and I took turns detailing the terrifying tale of being captured by a group of deranged cannibals somewhere in those cursed mountains. The deputy assured us that a search party would be dispatched immediately to locate and apprehend the mountain men who had hunted us so mercilessly. Our involvement was over. Now it was law enforcement's turn to take action. In the end, that merciless gang of cannibalistic mountain men was apprehended. The investigation led to several missing persons cases being solved innocent hikers and campers who had stumbled upon their territory had faced gruesome fates. Sam, Katie, and I were lucky enough to survive that horrifying ordeal and came out of it physically unscathed, although the emotional scars may never fully heal. We can only hope that others who wander through those mountains would have cell reception if they'd ever find themselves facing similar circumstances. Rumors began to spread about strange occurrences taking place in that unsettling region, but we tried our best not to dwell on what had happened. Instead, we found solace in mutual support and focused on all that still lay ahead for us beyond those trees those thickets haunted by the ghosts of our past that sought to cling on to us forever. Yet somehow we managed. Together we forged ahead, a bond built not only on shared grief but also a steadfast resilience aimed towards reclaiming our lives. We have persevered day by day, still in awe of our survival against the vicious attacks we surely were never meant to withstand and we never will forget the others who'd also encountered the menace lurking in those mountains but were not fortunate enough to tell their own stories. This happened to me a few years ago. I had just gotten a new job, 
and my co-workers and I decided to take a much-needed trip to Yosemite National Park to celebrate. There were four of us, myself, Elliot Washington, Veronica Hastings, and Rafaela Santini. We arrived at the park early in the morning and immediately started hiking. The sun was shining, birds were singing, and the smell of fresh pine filled our noses. We stopped occasionally for water breaks or to snack on trail mix we had brought with us. At one point during our hike, I mentioned that I'd grown up not too far away from the park. My parents used to bring me here every summer when I was a kid. That truly ignited nostalgia. As we continued on our hike, we stumbled upon an offshoot path that none of us recognized from our maps. Intrigued by the mysterious trail, we unanimously agreed to follow it and see where it led. Slowly but surely, the once friendly terrain became increasingly sinister. Gradually, the lush flora began giving way to eerie stillness. Regardless of the unsettling shift in scenery, we press on, captivated by what might lie ahead. The laughter we previously shared was reduced to mutually attentive silence as rustling leaves and snapping branches echoed ominously through the now barren landscape. Suddenly from behind us came a frantic scream. It was Veronica. We whipped around only to find her kneeling down next to her mutilated backpack which appeared as if some animal had torn it apart. Its contents were strewn across the ground, clothing ripped like tissue paper and food ravaged beyond recognition. We looked nervously at one another. At this point panic set in for me. But putting aside fear we tried quickly piecing together what had happened while we were preoccupied with conversation. None of us could speculate what could have done such damage in such little time, until Valerie revealed her gruesome discovery that gouged into the foliage were deeply unsettling claw marks which hinted at a cruel fate. Despite the stark warning, we decided not to call for help. No service meant hiking our way back out was our only hope. As we moved on with our journey, a bone-chilling sense of being watched consumed us all. We heard distant screams from multiple places at once. None could be traced, sounding increasingly fluent in its orchestration of dread. My co-workers and I moved as quickly and quietly as possible through the forest glade, desperate to find our way back to a populated area without attracting attention from whatever creatures were stalking us. The sun sank lower in the sky, casting elongated shadows that only heightened my paranoia. I imagined monstrous figures emerging from the darkness around us. Fueling adrenaline surged through my veins urged me to sprint out of this nightmare, but knew something was waiting for me growing exponentially impatient by our continuance in this cursed territory. Suddenly, Elliot was ripped away from us with extraordinary force by an unseen menace, his terrified expression sealed in memory as we watched his body disappear among the trees. We screamed for him, and yet there would be no answer forthcoming. Terror beyond description would follow suit soon after. My hand instinctively rocketed towards the handgun I brought with me for self-defense, a decision I could soon be grateful for but never truly fathom employing prior to witnessing such horrors before me. Turning back was futile, seeking answers, absolution. We had long since wandered too deep into enemy territory, left nearly at their mercy by my tragic curiosity for paths unexplored. We continued moving, now down to four. Sarah tried to call for help on her phone, but the signal was virtually non-existent in this remote area. Not knowing what else to do, we sought shelter in a nearby cave, hoping to hide from our predators. We huddled together in the darkness, trying our best to remain silent and calm. What should have been a team-building retreat had turned into a desperate bid for survival. Moments later, a guttural growl echoed outside the cave's entrance, followed by more. 
My co-workers and I exchanged panicked looks as we realized we were surrounded by the cannibalistic mountain men who were infamous in these parts. I held on to my handgun tightly as one of the men sluggishly entered our hiding spot. The dim light revealed horrifying details about him. Coarse hair covered his body, pus-filled boils dotted his repulsively scarred face, and his jagged teeth were caked with dried blood. Holding my breath and attempting to steady my trembling hands, I aimed at him and pulled the trigger. The gunshot temporarily drowned out our muted sobs, and the man slumped to the ground with a disturbing thud. We didn't have time to celebrate our minor victory. More of these monstrous men closed in on us. It was clear there was no way they'd let us go easily. Summoning all my strength, I sprinted toward another exit in the cave. My co-workers followed closely behind me, their panting breaths filled with panic. As we emerged from the cave and fled deeper into the forest, I feared that daylight wouldn't save us from this nightmare. Their relentless pursuit suggested they were driven by an insatiable hunger that would not rest until we were all dead or captured. One by one, my co-workers succumbed to the ruthless onslaught. Claire tripped over a tree root and fell prey to long-nailed hands that dug into her flesh. Sam was found suspended from a tree limb, his limbs contorted into unnatural angles. Christy was dragged through the undergrowth, kicking and screaming into oblivion. My last remaining co-worker, Daniel, called for help on his radio but the only reply we received was a shattering scream that once more confirmed our grim situation. As Daniel tossed the radio aside, we couldn't help but shudder at the realization that we could only depend on ourselves for rescue. Our pursuit led us to a steep cliff. With no other choice but to climb down, we descended carefully, struggling to maintain our footing on the slippery rocks. The mountain men snarled and shrieked above us as they realized they couldn't climb down as easily. As Daniel and I neared the bottom of the cliff, I dropped my handgun into the valley below. Desperate for some good fortune in this hell's cape, I prayed that we might come across a trail or a road that could guide us back to safety, or at least away from their territory. Daniel and I walked through the forest along a narrow ravine, an impossible option for our predators who presumably knew their territory better than anyone. Our pace quickened as we sensed our advantage growing. After two days of relentlessly cutting through forests and hillsides, we finally stumbled upon a distant road that shimmered in the twilight haze. Driven by exhaustion and exhilaration, we staggered onto the paved surface where we soon discovered tire tracks, a sign of civilization. Our rescue came in the form of an old woman driving her rusty truck past us as she returned from her weekly trip to town. Our disheveled appearance told her everything she needed to know about our ordeal. Without uttering a word, she drove us directly to the nearest police station where Daniel and I recounted our horrifying tale. Though investigators took extensive notes during our statement, they would never find any concrete evidence of the massacre that had unfolded. No bodies, no weapons, no traces. What they did find were chilling legends of cannibalistic mountain men who lurked in the depths of those forests, and truth we had experienced firsthand. In the months that followed, Daniel and I tried our best to resume our lives, as different as they now were. No words can describe the loss of our colleagues and friends. Their gruesome fates haunt us daily. We are forever bound by the horrifying events we both survived, and by the shared knowledge that deep in those daunting woods, our twisted predators continue to hunger for life beyond their hidden domain. This happened to me a week ago. I was visiting the dense Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia for a hiking trip, alone but prepared. My name is Elwood Crenshaw, a typical office worker craving some adventure. 
It turns out, I would get more than I bargained for. The air was crisp as I began my trek. The paths were well maintained at first, but eventually gave way to wilder terrain as I delved deeper into the mountains. Soon, it was just me, my heavy breathing and the crunching leaves underfoot. As I scrambled over rocks and ducked under branches, I remembered a conversation with my co-worker Marty. He claimed he once saw a disheveled man in these woods who gave him an eerie feeling before disappearing from sight. We had laughed it off at the time. Later that afternoon, I stumbled upon a gnarled tree that seemed out of place. Its bark was gouged out in places creating crude symbols. Interesting, but probably local kids just messing around. Not expecting trouble, I pressed onward. Around dusk, something caught my attention faint stench lingering in the air. Curiosity peaked and aware of the encroaching darkness, I followed the scent to its source, a bloody makeshift campsite with torn tents and scattered belongings. My heart raced as adrenaline surged through my veins. Claw marks adorned everything. This couldn't be the work of any animal that roamed these hills, at least not any ordinary creature. Suddenly feeling vulnerable and questioning my safety, I decided to retrace my steps back to civilization. My hurried footsteps were drowned out by an eerie silence that enveloped the woods. Soon enough, darkness fell and only my flashlight illuminated the narrow path laid ahead of me. Thoughts raced through my head as fear clawed at me relentlessly. A shriek pierced through the monotony, presumably someone in great distress. My heart pounded, and my mind was torn. Should I save them or save myself? The cry for help was so desperate, so distinctly human, I couldn't ignore it. Holding my breath and clenching my pocket knife, I moved cautiously towards the sound. As I drew nearer, the cries grew weaker. Abruptly, they stopped altogether as I stumbled upon another gruesome sight. The source of the screams, a mangled corpse of a man sprawled across the earth. Barely recognizable except for his face that clearly showcased an expression of sheer terror. Cold realization hit me humans were hunting here. Horrified, my rationale crumbled in fear, thinking about those cannibalistic mountain men rumored in legends passed down by locals in hushed whispers. The tales started to seem less like folklore and more like an unseen reality now haunting my every step. Angry voices echoed through the trees accompanied by loud stomps. They were coming closer. Heart pounding against my chest like a relentless hammer, my fight-or-flight response kicked in. I sought refuge behind a nearby bush. I caught glimpses of their monstrous shapes slumbering into view. Their eyes glinted menacingly in the dim moonlight filtering through the treetops. Morbid curiosity pushed me to take a closer look at these beasts out of legend. Narrow-faced with bulbous noses and thin lips twisted into cruel sneers, their demented grins snarling at discordant laughter resounding throughout the forest. Most notably, they were armed, not just with crude clubs and knives but firearms well suited for their sick games. Oblivious to my presence, they argued among themselves in crude dialect punctuated by guttural noises, presumably debating on tracking down their prey, which had eluded them for now. That would be me. Their grotesque exchange was interrupted suddenly by the distant howl of wolves. They halted, exchanged few measured glances and decided to retreat, turning into the unseen darkness of the woods they called home. My heart lurched in relief. Exhausted, but aware danger still lurked among those tall oaks and twisted branches, I continued my flight from this deranged nightmare. I felt so utterly helpless, like a rat trapped in a maze designed by sadistic predators. With every step I took, the shadows seemed to twist into mocking apparitions poised to reenact the bloody scene I had narrowly escaped. 
The will to survive alone drove me relentlessly through the suffocating darkness. Stumbling through the darkness, I tried to keep a clear and level-headed mindset. My only priority was to get as far away from those monstrous beings and their insatiable hunger for human flesh. With the howl of the wolves offering a welcome distraction, I tried to come up with a plan. Every ounce of my being wanted to call for help. But even in my heightened state of fear, I knew that there was no phone reception out here in these remote woods. It seemed appropriate that this desolate place would be their hunting ground, isolating their victims and shielding themselves from the outside world. As I pressed further into the depths of the forest, determined to reach civilization, an unsettling realization crept over me. Those cannibals knew these woods far better than I did. Their expert tracking skills and the ferocity of their pursuit had already made that all too clear. My only hope now was to outsmart them, or at least survive long enough for someone else to stumble upon this gruesome nightmare. After all, there must be others like me, innocent people who inadvertently strayed into this accursed territory. That thought sent chills down my spine as it dawned on me just how many people may have met their end at the hands of these twisted predators. The depravity of these men seemed limitless. One need only look into their cruel eyes to see they reveled in their bloodlust and thirst for human suffering. Pushing exhaustion and terror aside, I continued moving at a relentless pace, desperately praying that every step would bring me closer to safety. Memories of countless horror stories played like a twisted slideshow in my mind, fueling my urge to escape relentless tormentors. In the distance, I spotted a glimmer of hope, faint lights flickering over what appeared to be an old trail leading down into the valley. Heart pounding, I used what little energy remained in my shaking limbs and sprinted towards the path, only to find a dilapidated cabin standing sinister and seemingly abandoned. The unsettling gloom in the cabin was jarring, but my options were limited. I carefully crept inside, hoping this old shack offered temporary salvation from those hunting me. As I lay hidden beneath a rotten wooden floorboard, trying to catch my breath and steady my nerves, I heard their voices drawing closer. Those painful memories of their macabre laughter echoing through the forest sent shivers down my spine. Soon, their voices were met with the cacophonous howls and snarls of wolves, drawn no doubt by the stench of death that clung to these men like an indelible mark. The sounds of frantic yells and gunshots pierced the otherwise silent night, signaling that even these sadistic monsters were capable of showing fear. Through the cracks in the floorboards above me, I witnessed a gruesome battle unfold between these cannibalistic mountain men and the wolves, primal instincts clashing with cruel intelligence. Their screams filled my ears as one by one, they succumbed to the might of the wild beasts. Once silence descended upon that wretched place again, I mustered all the strength I had left and crawled out from my hiding spot. The sight that greeted me was both grotesque and oddly satisfying. The vicious mountain men who had mercilessly hunted innocent victims had fallen prey to nature's indiscriminate wrath. I stumbled past carnage and gore-ridden battle of survival remnants, and continued down the trail towards those flickering lights below. As I emerged from this hellish forest into the relative safety of society— one thing became catastrophically undeniable. Anyone who ventured into those dark woods carried an unspoken agreement that could very well sign their death warrant. The harrowing ordeal imprinted on me would never fade away. Memories of those narrow-faced monsters with their curled sneers would always lurk in the recesses of my mind, serving as a reminder of how perilously close I had come to sharing their victim's grim fate.